Hello, everyone. Hello. Aloha. Good afternoon, everyone. We're signing on, and it looks like we've got attendees filtering in, so that's great. Hey.
Lance, this is Greg. Um, I th think we should go ahead and get started if you'd like to kick things off, sir. All right, absolutely, Greg. I was just sending you a note to ask if you <laughs> wanted to go ahead and get started or wait a couple minutes, but uh, now we know the answer to that. And I wanna say uh, happy Wednesday to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning in some cases. I know my good friend Deb is um, joining us from the Hawaiian Islands. So um, aloha to you and good morning, Deb. Glad you're on. Um, and of course, all of those across the country who are part of the council and then likewise, those who are uh, watching today. My name is Lance Robertson, as you see on the screen, um, administrator for ACL and assistant secretary for aging. And, um, you know, it's my honor to sort of kick us off to welcome you. I'm pleased to uh, convene and call to order the third meeting of the advisory council. Uh, certainly, it's an exciting time and so glad to see the momentum uh, that has built uh, within this group and the progress that we're making towards the development of the National Caregiving Strategy. I want to welcome, again, all council members and certainly members of the general public who might be watching to this meeting. And um, from, me, from uh, me to you, I want to just make sure that you're doing okay. I know that uh, during times like this, we're all so plugged in and we're working hard, putting in a lot of hours. and you know, just as a reminder, um, as a friend and colleague, just take care of yourself and please make sure that you're meeting your needs and then taking good care of your family. And hey, that's a lesson I too have to take to heart. So uh, again, I would certainly want to kick us off and remind us all that we are highly valuable um, in this role and in so many others, but uh, maintaining our own health and safety has to remain a priority. It's such a different season, as we know, uh, but I can tell you that this pandemic has absolutely not weakened our commitment to this important work. So thank you, thank you for your flexibility, your resiliency, and your dedication. And um, as we could all agree, if anything, uh, this pandemic has shown how critical it is to have the right supports in place to help caregivers. You know, um, and I know you're aware as well, but as I've talked to so many different folks across the country during the pandemic, and particularly caregivers for so many, there's really now, of course, a heightened um, obligation, if you will, in terms of their care for the loved ones. Um, in some cases now that is um, pivoting to full-time care. Maybe they have to do um, a lot more um, medically related types of care. And just in so many ways, it really has just fallen on them almost entirely during this season for understandable reasons. Uh, but so many of these caregivers also, as you recognize, um, if they're professionals, many of them now are in a telework posture which means they're now full-time caregivers, they're now full-time teleworkers, and there are some who are homeschooling. Now, I'm glad that I have a 19-year-old and a 23-year-old self-sufficient college kids. I don't have to homeschool, but I can imagine the pressures that that's creating. So, um, as we all know, the traditional stress markers have certainly been elevated or amplified. Um, these caregivers need us now more than ever. We know the strategy is going to drive conversations and creating the best supports possible for these champions. Our efforts to support families and family caregivers, again, has never been more critical. Our nation's uh, response to the impact of COVID-19 is occurring, as you know, at every level within the federal government, as well as on the ground in every state and community. So what does that look like? And real quickly, I just thought I'd share on behalf of the Administration for Community Living, Specific to the pandemic, thanks to the supplementals we received through both the Families First Act and then also the CARES Act, we've actually been able to now um, pump out to states an additional $1.2 billion through ACL. Um, about 60% of that has gone to fight uh, food insecurity through our meals program. But as part of the CARES Act package, um, more program diversity in terms of support and that included caregivers. We were able through the CARES Act to put almost $100 million out to states to help strengthen the caregiver support program that we all know, recognize, and appreciate. And states, of course, have this money and about half are already operationalizing access to the additional funds and increasing service options. So that's a great thing. Um, we, of course, at ACL continue to lean forward. There's so much technical assistance and guidance that we're offering, as you can imagine. Uh, within ACL on the aging side through the Administration on Aging, um, nearly 30 new documents that we placed on our website that offer guidance to certainly first and foremost the agencies we contract with, but to so many others who are interested in how program services can still be offered during this pandemic. 
So if you haven't had a chance, I'd encourage you to go to our website at acl.gov. I think it's a great resource all the time, even outside of the pandemic. But certainly if you're interested, we have a COVID-19 page on there that really is resource rich. And one of our primary goals in launching that was to make sure that for the Aging and Disability Network, there was a great place to land for timely pertinent information. Um, I think we all were grateful for all the different information at the beginning of the pandemic and stretching even into today. But of course it can be overload because there's so many different um, documents out there, so many different agencies, you know, starting of course with CDC and FEMA and so many other critical partners and they're all doing great work. They're putting out great information, but we have done our best to make sure the ACL.gov website is a fabulous um, and efficient landing page for uh, anyone in the aging and disability network. Also, I would just clarify and reinforce for all of you that at ACL, we continue to work very diligently across HHS and supporting the work that we're doing to fight the pandemic. And then of course, also across the federal government that includes, you know, regular conversations with FEMA, uh, USDA, the VA, and so many others. Again, it is a whole of government. It's a whole of nation approach. Um, and then certainly in my role, my obligation remains true to keep the secretary's office updated on what we're doing here with the council. So I do that pretty often. And again, just, just grateful for that. Um, during these unprecedented times, I am heartened uh, to certainly see the great turnout and participation that we have for this third meeting. We sort of wondered, um, you know, I thought it went well in February, although I couldn't get my uh, video to work for a while, but it finally worked. Uh, but again, we are fortunate that we have technology now that permits us to virtually meet like this. And, you know, I, I feel like this format is successful, uh, certainly given the cards we've been dealt. I hope you feel the same. I thought February's meeting went well. Um, hopefully today's meeting and tomorrow's meeting again will likewise go flawless as we head into this new normal and at least for the near term this is probably the way we're going to continue to dialogue and meet um, to sort of state the obvious so glad that we did the test run as well. I think it's reasonable to, to expect that um, you know again for the at least the near future uh, we're going to continue to meet like this but uh, we have to remain committed to making sure we're making that critical progress so so thank you thank you. Uh, since our last meeting in February, I know that the council subcommittees have been meeting regularly and making great progress on development um, towards a national strategy. And that is so heartening to hear. And I'm pleased to see the progress that we've made in this regard and on the development of the initial report. Uh, so again, my, my extreme gratitude um, as chair that, that we're still making such great progress and that the pandemic really hasn't created much of a hiccup for our critical work. But uh, speaking of the report, I'm also pleased to announce, uh, to announce that we have another team member and I want to make sure all of you know Sarah uh, Markle. Sarah actually comes to us with extensive writing and journalism background um, and will be a tremendous, ax, ax, tremendous asset to our team as we um, manage the writing effort. So again, my thanks to Sarah, I'm glad she's part of our team. And then related to staff, I just wanna take a quick a moment, a point of personal privilege as chair. And I want to also share that a couple of weeks ago, the federal government held its annual public service recognition week. Some of you are familiar with that. Some of you may not be. It's again, a time where we spend a week really acknowledging federal employees who have reached certain benchmarks. And I think that's critical, but for me, it also affords us an opportunity to say thank you to all the public servants. So, you know, I have to tell you that as members of this council, if you have um, an opportunity, I would I would be just so honored if you would um, just thank some of the folks that you know who are federal employees who are working uh, so diligently on this effort. I am so grateful uh, for them and I know you are too. And of course, at the top of that list is the um, always modest Greg Link, who will not be happy that I called him out, but uh, Greg's amazing. And we're just so glad that he continues to provide fabulous leadership on this effort. So again, even though Public Service Recognition Week now is a couple of weeks old, it doesn't matter. I think anytime we can, we need to pause and say, hey, thanks, guys, because I know these federal colleagues are putting in countless hours and juggling this amongst other responsibilities. So thank you. Thank you to Greg. Thank you to Lori and so many others from um, ACL. And then certainly all the other fellow public servants across the federal government space. And there are many who are on this council and many who are supporting the council work in so many ways. So my thanks to all of you. And I would hope that as council members, if you're a non-Fed, if you can just take a moment and say thank you to those folks too, I would really appreciate it. So our meeting today and tomorrow is all about the council digging deeper into several important issues related to family caregiving and how we will address those issues on both the report 
and within the national strategy. So I know the um, ACL and NASHP, the NASHP team have prepared a packet um, and a, a, a great packet for you today. It includes the agenda and um, there's presentation material in there. All of that will help inform our work. And I wanna say thanks in advance uh, for today's um, presentations by Scott, Kitty, Pamela, and Lynn. Thank you guys. I know it's gonna be highly informative. I'm excited to hear more about that. Um, we're gonna hear from them about um, a number of things. Uh, family leave, respite, um, an analysis of the RFI that was conducted earlier this year, uh, caregiving research and data. So a lot of good meaty information that we're getting ready to jump into. Uh, and then tomorrow towards the end of our meeting, uh, we'll spend some time uh, working on the uh, driver diagram that is shaping your thinking on both the national uh, strategy document and the recommendations that will be included in the initial report. So um, I have to apologize again, I have to step away at about two o'clock Eastern today to, to um, join another call, lead another call, national call, um, but I'm gonna try to pop back in when I can and I'll, I'll be a part of tomorrow's conversation as well. I know we have, as you can anticipate, a lot going on at ACL, so um, this is still though a critical priority and I boast about the great work that you're doing as frequently as I can. As I mentioned, I do that uh, for the secretary, I do that across the ACL team, across conversations with our federal partners and so much more. So one final note, uh, I think most of you know, but May is Older Americans Month. So Older Americans Month, every year we celebrate that. It's an opportunity to say thank you to the older adults who have made this country as great as it is and to really recognize their ongoing contributions. It just blows me away. Uh, story after story after story. You can see some of that on our website at acl.gov. Um, the theme this year is Make Your Mark. And of course, we set that theme up long before the pandemic, um, but I am still really, really happy to say that so many folks have taken on that challenge. And, you know, a lot of what we're doing now to support Older Americans Month obviously is being done virtually, but uh, the creativity, the commitment, all of that is just fabulous. So again, for those of you who aren't familiar with Older Americans Month, um, jump on our website, take a peek, but also again, just um, acknowledging and appreciating what older adults mean to all of us in our community. Uh, May is a month we do that formally, but of course at ACL, we do it every day of the year. Uh, so again, I wanna thank all of you for all that you do. I wanna thank you for giving so generously of your time and your talents uh, to serve on this, ta on this council. Um, and of course, for your care and your compassion. I know, I know, having been a part of this team now that you guys are all so plugged in and this is real for you and you're really making contributions that I would say are above and beyond. So I want to thank you for that. And I know that together, uh, we really will make a difference for um, caregivers, um, for grandparents raising grandchildren, for so many others who are in a caregiving role. So again, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Be well. Uh, thanks again for your time and commitment. And with that, Greg, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you, Lance. Um, I, I, I so appreciate your support and, and your leadership in all of this. Um, it really, it really, truly does make a difference. Uh, and good afternoon, um, everyone, um, all the members of the council, um, as well as the um, members of the general public. It looks like we have right now about 55 folks from around the country um, tuning in to um, watch various parts of our meeting and hear our discussions today. So I'm really glad about that. Um, before I dive into the agenda, and I'm going to go through some some of the more boring housekeeping details of this webinar. I wanna ask Cheryl Thompson, um, our amazing contract support, to do a quick roll call of the council members. Um, before she does that, I, I see that we have a few folks who don't have their cameras on and, and that's fine. I just wanted to remind you that if you, if you can turn on a camera and you do have one and if you'd like us to see your, your fabulous faces, then please go ahead and do that. But Cheryl, uh, can you do, run through the roll and just sure. see who we have here and do a final sound check? Sure, wonderful, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will not call Lance's name, we already know he's here, but with our co-chairs, Casey Shillam, Alan Stevens. I'm here. Thank you. Nancy Murray. Here. And for our non-federal members, Ben Bledsoe. Present. Joe Caldwell. Here. Diane Caradu. Here. James Cheely. Here. Gisela Dolan. Here. Brenda Gallant. 
Catherine Alicia Georges. Here. Rhonda Montgomery. Here. James Murtha. Here. Deborah Stone Walls. Here. Teresa Tanus. Here. Carol Zerniel. Here. And for our federal members, Elizabeth Darling. And we may have her alternate, Liliana Hernandez. Here. Thank you. Linda Davis. And do we have either of her alternates, Christine Myrna? Or Anna Schuster? Bruce Fink. Hello. And we do know that Melissa Gerald is unable to attend today. And Melissa Harris will join us at 2.30 p.m. Helen Lamont. And I did see Helen on video. Okay, Tamara Mays. And Helen Lamont, I see you on. Hi, I'm here. Thank you. Lisa McGuire. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, thank you. Katie O'Callaghan. And if we have our alternate, Diane Mitchell. Hector Ortiz. Rosemary Payne. Mark Vafiades. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Joan Wise. Good afternoon. I'm here. Good afternoon. Thank you. And our Nashby colleagues, Wendy Fox Grage. Here. Kitty Purrington. Here. And John A. Hartford Foundation, Ronnie Snyder. She should be coming later. Okay, thank you, Scott. And Scott Bain? Here. Thank you. And our Health and Aging Policy Fellows, Laurel Trailer. I'm here. Hi. Thank you. And Kelly O'Malley? Okay, thank you, Greg. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, and it, it is great to see everyone. I, I, have, I was on a meeting like this yesterday, and it's really, this is probably the most people I've actually seen their faces in about two months. So it's wonderful to see you all, and I can't wait to dive into the agenda today. Um, our meeting is scheduled to go over the course of today and tomorrow for three hours each day from 1 to 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, we have not, because of the amount of information that we have built into the agenda, um, we've not built in um, breaks, but you all should feel free to um, step away if you need to for whatever reason and then come back um, and, and that, that'll be just fine. The meeting, um, this meeting is being recorded and closed captioned. And for the members of the um, general public who are attending, um, the, a full recording of the meeting will be posted um, sometime after we conclude tomorrow, a few days to a couple of weeks. Um, as will all of the PowerPoint slides um, that we're going to be going through um, will also be posted. And I've seen all of the slides from our various presenters over the next two days. And I can tell you that the information in there um, is, is really wonderful. And I think it will help um, move us along um, a great deal. Um, the members of the public who are watching are, feel, um, are free to make, um, make their comments in the chat feature if they have comments that they would like to add. Um, and while we might not be able to answer or acknowledge all of the comments or questions, please know that they are being captured and we can refer back to them and um, circle back to you if we have specific questions. Um, for the members of the council, um, because we're recording, if you, if there, if you have comments or, or input that you would like to provide, please do so over the, um, over the microphone so that we can capture it on the, on the recording and um, have it closed captioned. <laughs> 
So um, as Lance mentioned, this is the third meeting of the Caregiving Advisory Council. Um, and the agenda that we developed for you today, um, my team and the NASHP team really collaborated on this to, and we based the agenda on the past two months worth of subcommittee meetings in March and April. Um, those meetings, um, as you all know, because you were part of them, were really productive and resulted in some considerable and measurable progress on both um, on our journey as we develop the, the national strategy and begin conceptualizing what the um, the first, the initial report's going to look like. And as you'll recall, most of those meetings over those two months consisted of work on the driver diagram um, that's going to serve as the foundation for the national strategy and shape our thinking about that. Um, as well as the recommendations that will ultimately be included in the um, in the report. But during those meetings in March and April, Wendy and I clearly heard from um, many of you that you wanted to hear some more detail and have a, a chance to interact with folks um, on a, a several different topics for which there was particularly robust discussion. Um, and so this is what we've done for you today is we have pulled together um, presentations um, from several experts um, out there and many of you know them quite well. Um, but we're, we're hoping that these, that these um, presentations will give you some, the additional food for thought that you all need as you consider um, how the strategy is going to take shape and, and the recommendations that will ultimately be part of the report. Um, so if you look, just looking over the agenda very quickly, you'll see that um, our first presentation after we do a round of project updates um, next, we're going to hear from um, Dr. Pamela Nadash. Um, Pamela and her team um, at the University of Massachusetts, Boston are um, analyzing the RFI information. Um, and I know the council members have received advanced copies of those slides. Um, if you've had a chance to look at them, I think you'll agree that the information that we got is pretty exciting. And I think it will go a long way towards infusing our work with the voice of caregivers. Um, we're also gonna delve into some family leave um, information and discussion with Lynn Feinberg. Then we're gonna to get tomorrow um, into a discussion about respite from our good friend and colleague, Jill Kagan. Um, and then we're going to have, we're gonna wind up our presentations tomorrow with a look at the current state of data and research in family caregiving um, by the council's own Dr. Joe Caldwell, as well as um, Dr. Scott Beach. Um, they will lead that discussion. And then tomorrow we're gonna to wind up the, the latter part of the afternoon with about with some time dedicated to really beginning to infuse what you heard over the course of these presentations, as well as any thought that you've been giving um, to the driver diagram. Uh, we're gonna continue to fine tune that. Um, and then we're also gonna take stock of where we are in our work and make some decisions tomorrow about um, whether we resume subcommittee meetings uh, beginning in June, or whether we consider convening um, the council in this fashion as the full council um, more frequently as we maybe look to accelerate the work, but we'll do more on that tomorrow. Um, and then finally, just for the last of the housekeeping things, I wanted to say that um, um, ACL and, and NASHP, because we are working so closely together on this, we're looking ahead to the rest of our year and, um, and how the current pandemic is impacting how we work and how we interact. And for our planning and budget purposes, um, we're looking um, at whether or not to even consider planning and convening um, in-person meetings for any of the remainder of 2020. Um, you know, we had our first, the first meeting of the council was back in August of 2019. You know, obviously we had hoped that we would, you know, within a year or less be able to convene you all in person again. However, that's not the case. But given the amount of advanced planning um, and, you know, the expenses associated with reserving meeting space potentially, reserving hotel blocks for our non-federal members who have to travel. We're wondering if we should just decide now um, that we want to convene full council meetings virtually for the remainder of 2020 and then reassess things maybe later in 2020, maybe around November, December, um, and then see what meeting in person again might look like beginning in 2021. Um, do the council members have any thoughts on this? Um, Anyone feel strongly that we should just go for all virtual um, for the rest of 2020, or should we hold off on decisions? Greg, this is Diane Caridou. Yes. With this pandemic, I mean, my travel to Washington is five hours 
yeah. on a crowded plane mm -hmm. in a hotel. I don't know sure. how clean and whatnot. I truly would not be comfortable traveling the rest of the year. Understood. Understood. Greg, this is yeah. Ron, and yeah. uh, I too am in Aloha country yeah. <laughs> with my husband, who is uh, one of the vulnerables, and so mm -hmm. I would never be able to travel this year. Sure, sure, understood. Hi, Greg, it's Deborah from Maui. I think uh, virtual is a great way to go for this year. Okay. And this Carol Zerniel, I agree, virtual. Okay. All right. Alan Stevens, I agree, virtual, and oh. as well as my organization will not allow out-of-state travel currently, oh, and that's I have no idea when that will be. Yeah, and, and you make a great point, um, you know, federal travel, federal employees are not permitted to travel. We don't know when we will have that permission again, um, and so that's something to consider as well. Um, I'm, I'm Beginning to hear a general consensus. Um, do we need to push out a poll to ask every all of the council members, or are we just fine with um, going going ahead and saying that for the rest of 2020 we'll do virtual meetings of the full council, and then of course, if we meet at subcommittees, those will be as they've always been via um, teleconference amongst the council members. Should we do a quick poll, Cheryl? Do you want to push that out? We can just. Make sure everyone's had a chance to weigh in. So um, this is for any, all of the council members, if you all want to just weigh in, um, virtual or in person, and we will then see what we have here. Greg, this is James Cheeley. I was just disappointed that Deborah didn't invite us to Hawaii. Well, I know, <laughs> but we'll get her next year, right? We'll, we'll all get out there. <laughs> and, okay, and well, I it do, look good. I do want to point out that Rhonda's here as well. So um, Rhonda's in Hawaii too. So she so we could have a party at one house one day and then party yes. together. Yeah, Sounds put, good. The, put All the budget right. from this year to next year. Yeah, well, it looks right. like double it up. Definitely. It looks like we have 100% agreement that we're just going to do virtual meetings. So thank you all very much. That was that was extremely helpful. And we we will proceed accordingly. Um, with meeting planning and, and moving ahead in this virtual environment. It's getting surprisingly easy, um, I think, or it's, it's more comfortable um, as we do more of this to be able to meet and work this way. Although there's nothing like being able to just, you know, hug someone you're happy to see, but um, that's, we'll have to wait for that. So let's move on to the next section of the agenda, which are just the project updates. Um, as you all are aware, the council members, um, you all have been up to a lot in your work to support and, and um, move the work ahead. But um, ACL and NASHPE have also been um, very much um, engaged in a number of areas. And I just wanted to provide folks with a bit of an update as to where things have been happening. So on the ACL side, um, you all hopefully have seen the raise progress report that we um, that we put together and published um, on the ACL website. This raise progress report was led or developed and pulled together by our three health and aging policy fellows. Our two policy fellows from last year, Lauren Bangerter and Kelly O'Malley, um, as well as our current um, health and aging policy fellow, who you'll hear from, uh, more from in just a moment, Laurel Trailer. Um, pulled together this progress report. We felt it was important um, to just put it out there, all of the great work that has been going on and everything that we have accomplished. And so um, that um, report is up on the ACL website. Um, and for those of you who are members of the public, um, once these PowerPoint slides are posted, this will be the direct link to that, but it is available on the ACL um, Raise Act webpage. Um, we also released a, um, a blog from Lance, which was then picked up by Secretary Azar on family caregiving during COVID-19. That blog heavily featured and reported on the work of this council, as well as the Advisory Council to Support Grandparents Raising Grandchildren. Um, we linked to a number of the, um, the meetings that we've had, some of the materials that we've produced, um, and the fact that it was that it was published in the secretary's website 
um, and, as a sec and as an HHS secretary's blog, um, el only elevated our work and made it that much more visible. And so we are, are really getting out there um, and, and making the progress that we're making known. The final little update, um, this is for the council members. Um, you all are aware that we have been working to develop um, a, a collaboration platform for the council members. Um, it's sort of like a, a what we're, we're calling it kind of a, a uh, SharePoint on steroids because we're hoping we're developing this this working environment where council members can share information and ideas, um, look at articles, um, perhaps make edits to documents, develop products and materials. We are still very much in the midst of working with our IT contractors on that. We have Lori Stahlbaum and my contractors and I have been engaged in a round of testing of a, of a test site. Um, and we are still needing to work out some glitches because we need to make sure that it is as usable, as user friendly um, as possible um, so that it becomes a real resource to our council members. Um, so that's not something that's fallen off the radar screen, but um, it is something that we are still working on. Um, as, as Lance had alluded to, um, we're also really thrilled uh, that we have that I was able to bring on a new staff member to the ACL team, um, Sarah Markell. Uh, Sarah's an aging services program specialist um, in the Office of Supportive and Caregiver Services. Um, and she's going to be working in a couple of different areas. On one side, she's going to be supporting the work of our dementia portfolio on the, our Alzheimer's disease programs. But she's also gonna be dividing her time about 50% supporting us. Um, the council, ACL, um, as the project manager for writing the, the writing of the initial report. And I wanted to give Sarah just an opportunity to say hello, to introduce herself, and to kind of give you all a sense for how she's going to approach the work. Uh, so Sarah, did, can I turn it over to you for a few words? Great. Yes, hi, Greg. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Markell, and as Lance mentioned, I'm a relatively new member of Greg's team here at the Administration for Community Living. I think I'm on week five now, but it's all, it's all getting to be a blur since most of it takes place at my kitchen table. Um, my background is in communications project management and writing and editing, and previously I actually worked at the Administration for Community Living in the Office of External Affairs. At that time, I did a lot of my work was supporting the disability community, so the aging side is new for me, and it's nice to work on the caregiver piece because it spans both uh, sides of the Administration for Community Living. Uh, most recently, I worked at CMS as a consultant, and, and I want to take a minute to explain what I did there because I think it feeds into how I'll be supporting the Caregiver uh, Advisory Council. When CMS is delivering docu developing documents, they're very, very technical and they're developed by a lot of experts. And so my role a lot of times was to take the content developed by those experts and bring it together into a coherent document with one voice and then move it through the clearance process move it through to editing, formatting, 508 compliance. And so if, if, you, if you think of a metaphor for that role, it's almost like bringing together a quilt. You've got lots of different voices and perspectives and experts. I, I'm certainly not the expert. My job was to stitch it together into something coherent and usable. And, and so what I'll be doing for the committee is, is very similar, developing tools, timelines, processes, so that the wonderful content that's being developed and your, your fantastic discussions and your voices get captured into something that's meaningful and helps us pave the way for the next project, which will be that, that strategy document. And, and that's, that's gonna be a major milestone um, in the history of, of supports and services for caregivers. And so we want it to be perfect. Um, as we move forward in these meetings, you're gonna see me on the meetings, you'll hear from me, I'll provide updates. I welcome your input. You are all always welcome to reach out by email through the inbox if you have an idea, a concern. You know, one of my tasks is to keep track of details. So if there's a study that came out in 1992 that you think, boy, we need to reference this, you let me know. I'll add it to my checklist and, and it'll get in there. So um, with that said, I don't wanna take up too much more of your time, but uh, I, I look forward to working with all of you. This is exciting and meaningful work, and uh, I'm just honored to be part of your team right now. 
I'm here if you need me. And um, with that, I'll hand it back to Greg. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and so as you can imagine, I'm, I'm particularly um, pleased and excited to have Sarah's um, skill set, but also just the fact that she's an amazing person to work with um, as a part of this team. I think um, her contributions will be truly meaningful. Did anyone have any questions for Sarah? Okay. Um, Earlier this year, um, many of our federal members had an opportunity to meet, um, virtually meet, um, Laurel Trailer. Um, Laurel is a health and aging policy fellow um, that also happens to work at the, at the VA. And Laurel has been tasked, during her one-year fellowship with us, has been tasked with leading our effort to complete the inventory of federal programs and initiatives that support family caregivers. And if you'll recall, it's that inventory piece that is one of the integral components of the initial report to Congress. Um, back in March, um, when we met with the federal partners, because this is really going to be their, con their one of their primary contributions to this effort, uh, we met with our federal partners to begin laying out our initial thinking for how we were going to accomplish that inventory. Well, then the pandemic came along and it's kind of upended things because as Lance mentioned earlier, um, you know, it has been an all hands on deck effort to meet, you know, to meet that re the response um, to that. And so Laurel and I began to rethink the approach for how we conduct this inventory in a way that is least burdensome to our federal members, but also um, gives maximum opportunity for them to provide input. So we changed our approach a little bit. And I wanted to just give Laurel an opportunity to kind of give an update on where things are with that and share with you our thinking for how we're going to go about this and then give you a heads up that we are going to be starting to come to our federal partners very soon for this information. So Laurel, can I turn it over to you? Thank you, Greg. So good morning and, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so you heard that the Federal Advisory Council will create an inventory of, of support services for caregivers and um, as one of the several components and contributions to our formal report. The inventory, I think, is really envisioned to lead um, a, and develop a comprehensive warehouse of federally funded efforts supporting caregivers. Um, the inventory itself will include not only um, demographic and outcome information, but also recommendations across organizations towards improving more effectively delivered services. And that's really going to be based on mission, purpose, and performance of each organization as contributors to our bigger goal of caregiver support. Um, through this process, we hope to identify and highlight some areas of overlap, your organization's unique expertise and practice, as well as outcomes and gaps and strategies to better serve our nation's caregivers. So our hope today, I think, was really to demo some content examples, but it seemed pretty cumbersome for purposes of this call. So what you have in front of you is a one-page template that contains our themes as we've envisioned them in the focus areas. So if you take a minute to look at the template, in the first section, you will see that we're really looking at mostly some of the de demographic content included, including, um, for example, department and agency, your caregiver programs and initiatives, and dates of implementation. We also um, would like to ask you for statutory authority as known, and we wanna hear about your program activities, your particular area of focus, and we would really like you to also consider both direct services such as home and community-based care programs or long-term care services and support, um, as well as the indirect programs um, and services that you might provide around education and benefits and quality improvement strategies and so forth. So we would also like to hear about the populations that you serve and how those caregivers can access that information. So moving on in the second section, the second bucket, our focus is on um, program metrics and program analytics, focusing on ideas like appropriations and expenditures and performance measures and program evaluation results. Again, we realize that you may not have access to some of this information and that's okay. 
we're looking for everything we could get. And once we pull together a first draft, we can reassess and ensure that we're including relevant and critical information. In the third and fourth sections, you'll have an opportunity to be a little bit more creative. We want to hear from you and your organizations about the types of gaps in your program for serving caregivers, what you think are important to program development and growth. And finally, we'll ask you to report on some of the visionary components related to your strategic planning process, how you may or may not or aspire to incorporate caregivers in that process. Um, we want to look at your use of evidence-based interventions and the potential for collaboration or coordination with other federal programs and opportunities that you see within your exciting work. And then finally, we'll ask you to talk about some of the most important uh, challenges and opportunities. So I think we really trust um, with your help and support, we'll end up with a pretty comprehensive report. And then I'm sure we'll talk again once we have all this pulled together. Um, so, so soon, each of you will receive um, a partially completed snapshot, if you will, um, on behalf of your organization. We're going to ask that you edit and complete the content and return it. And though we haven't really established a timeline at this point, not to worry, we um, really uh, realize the importance and have and will build in a time for you to vet content with your organizations and your uh, VIPs before we send out or publish any um, information. And so that's just a brief summary of the report as it stands. Um, there's a lot of information that's gone into the development thus far. Uh, you know, I'm pulling down, you know, publicly available information and we'll ask you to do the rest. So hopefully that will help you kind of move that along. Um, I think that's a wrap, Greg, back to you for some commentary or anything I might have missed. Great. Thank you so much, Laurel. Um, and so as you're gonna, as the council members will see as this meeting progresses, particularly with our next presentation, um, you're, you're, you'll see the, the reason that, you know, this is very much of a, of a the quilt reference that Sarah um, used before. We're, we're beginning to develop the, the report components um, ha has to be done and pulled together by multiple sources. And so I'm very thankful to Laurel's expertise um, and, uh, and as well as her role, you know, as a federal employee um, to be able to talk to our, her federal um, fellow federal um, employee partners um, to help us complete this information. Um, and keep in mind that this inventory is only for federal um, programs and initiatives that support family caregivers um, at this point. So any questions for Laurel? Okay, all right. Um, so that concludes the ACL updates. I wanted to um, turn it over to um, our, our good friend Scott Bain at the John A. Hartford Foundation. Um, he's going to be give, talking a little bit about um, the John A. Hartford support for one of the other components of the initial report, and that is the um, the, um, the the assessment or the evaluation of um, caregivers caregiving on um, Medicare um, programs. So. Um, that's one, one aspect that we have to look at. So, um, Scott, I'm going to let you take it away and talk about um, what's going on in that regard. Great. Thank you so much, Greg. I'm Scott Bain. I am a program officer at the John A. Hartford Foundation. So glad to be here today. And before diving into the status of the Medicare and Family Caregivers Report, I'll give you a quick uh, overview about who we are at the foundation and our family caregiving grant making since it may not be as familiar to some of you. Uh, thank you. I was just going to ask for the next slide. So the John A. Hartford Foundation, we are a private foundation based in New York City. The money from which it comes from the AMP grocery store chain. We work on a national basis and since 1982, the foundation has distributed $625 million, all focused on aging. Next slide, please. We have three program areas, age-friendly health systems, 
serious illness and end of life and family caregiving. And as you can see from the diagram, we very much see these areas as interconnected and reinforcing to one another. Next slide, please. Specifically regarding our family caregiving grant making, we've done a lot of work in this area. I won't go through all of these, but a couple of highlights. The foundation supported in 2016, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine report, Families Caring for an Aging America. The foundation has supported state level work through the Center for Healthcare Strategies. And we've also supported some work to help uh, clinicians and social service providers better respond to caregivers from diverse communities. So that has been done through the Diverse Elders Coalition. And then finally, the work connected to RAISE. In May of 2019, the foundation made a $2.5 million grant to the National Academy for State Health Policy to develop the Resource and Dissemination Center to support the work of the Ray's Family Caregiver Council. The goal of the Resource and Dissemination Center is to research policies and evidence-based programs, convene experts, provide information to the public, and then very excitingly to actually test some of the recommendations that the council will be coming up with in states. Under the leadership of the foundation's, foundation's president, Dr. Cherry Fulmer, and our vice president for program, Ms. Ronnie Snyder, who is now with us, the foundation really recognizes that family caregivers are the unsung heroines and heroes of, of our healthcare system, and that we can do better to support them. And given this, we are very supportive and grateful for all the wonderful work that the council is doing. Next slide, please. So this, the report around uh, Medicare and family caregivers, this is going to be done by their Center for Medicare Advocacy, which as you can see on the slide is a nonpartisan legal organization. They are experts in all things Medicare related from the point of view of beneficiaries. They are also a grantee of the foundation. So the foundation made a grant to them to develop this report on Medicare and family caregiving. Next slide, please. Uh, ACL, NASHPE, the Center for Medicare Advocacy, and the foundation, we all worked together to come up with a scope of work for this report. The first area that it's going to focus on is home health and home health aids. Since care is being provided in the home, that's and family caregivers are in the home, that's an obvious place to look. The center will look at covered services, but also criteria for covered services. And they will also spend time looking at the new supplemental benefits being allowed for Medicare Advantage plans. Second, they're going to analyze barriers and gaps because as all of you know all too well, when care does not go as planned, things, uh, it often falls to the family caregiver to make up for that. So they're going to look at that issue. They're going to look at recommendations, specifically looking at inventorying payment mechanisms under Medicare that can or could better support family caregivers. So for example, could, is there a payment mechanism that uh, concerning uh, discharging from post-acute hospitalizations that could better include family caregivers? And then lastly, under opportunities, the report will look specifically at work being done by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which supports development and testing of innovative payment and delivery service models to see if, again, if there are places there to better support family caregivers. Uh, so in summary, I will say, uh, I'm sure I don't need to tell this group that clearly Medicaid, Medicare, excuse me, is an important payer for healthcare for older adults and people with disabilities. The Center for Medicare Advocacy will be coming back 
with their report in early summer. And we look forward to sharing that report with the council as well, of course, our colleagues at ACL and Nashby. And that's the quick summary of where we are with Medicare and family caregivers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, did anyone have any questions for Scott um, or Ronnie, I, who I believe is now um, on the webinar or on our meeting um, about the work that they're doing in support of this particular aspect of what will ultimately be included, the information that will be included in the initial report. Any questions or thoughts for Scott? I have a question, Catherine Alicia Georges. Yes. Um, Scott, in your um, report, you talked about um, institutions and, and working with them around uh, what happens when people are being discharged from any level of care. And I'm thinking of acute care institutions going in back home to the community. And just wanted to remind you that in many of the states in this country, the CARE Act has been passed. And it's critical since it was ARP, I, I'm sorry, but I have to give ARP the credit that, that moved this legislation across the states, that, that that be taken into consideration and be considered critical in what people need to adhere to, institutions particularly. Uh, absolutely, and I should say that the CARE Act is very much on our radar screen. The foundation has made a grant to AARP to specifically work on implementing the CARE Act across states, so it's on our radar screen, but thank you for emphasizing it. And this is Ronnie, if I can add into that. Um, so we're really interested in the results of the CARE Act across those 40 some states um, and determining what's happened and what some of the best practices are. Because ultimately, once we have a good gauge on what the best practices are in supporting family caregivers of people who've been discharged, um, we wanna do our best to spread that as well. Thank you for that, that good point. Uh, Alan Stevens here, I, I just wanna, reinforce that it is such a very important um, act, um, but it is still largely seen as voluntary um, and we, we need some teeth put in it. So I would suggest all of this work is, is building up, I hope, to a point where someday this will be on the screen um, of regulatory agencies, surveying agencies, uh, that type of, of prominence as far as uh, uh, compliance uh, would, would go. But thank you for all you're doing. We'll get there. Thank you. And I should just say that, yes, we, we have had those exact same discussions about the act, that it's uh, voluntary but not required. And our AARP is very much working within that structure to go as far as they can go to enlist hospitals that are interested in working more closely with family caregivers. This is Bruce Fink from Indian Health Service. I'm curious, um, and I don't know the right answer here, but I'm curious about whether you've addressed the question of um, specifically with home health and home health, health aides that's been raised in the in recent months in the in the course of the pandemic about the vulnerability of that particular workforce um, of the financial and sort of health vulnerability of that particular workforce and whether that's going to be part of the con conversation or part of the study I would say that oh go ahead Ronnie um, I think that's a really important point. Um, and so the work that we have done thus far in our family caregiving program at the John A. Hartford Foundation has focused primarily on what we're calling family, family caregivers. And as we all know, that doesn't necessarily mean blood related, but unpaid caregivers. That said, and Scott and I have had this conversation many times, we see paid caregiving as the other side of that same coin. Um, and um, acknowledge how very, very important that is. 
And this is um, not specific to our family caregiving work, but I will tell you that in some other work that we're doing around um, the nursing home crisis with COVID-19, um, we're thinking very much about um, various um, CNA and, and health aid level individuals and um, their, the vital need for them in our healthcare system and the work that they're doing broadly. Um, and so we are not excluding them, but it is not part of the work that we've thus far been able to focus on in our family caregiving area. And, and this is Greg, I would add to that, that, it, you know, that, that it, they are the, the workforce, the caregiving workforce, the paid workforce is absolutely critical. And I, I think that in the discussions that the council members have had, particularly around their thoughts on the, the national strategy and what the strategy will speak to in terms of workforce and uh, workforce development and strengthening and protections, um, but also around um, the financial impact of, of, of situations like, like the pandemic that we're in now, that will become part of the national strategy, hopefully, um, as well as at least one of, you know, part of the recommendations that are made in the initial report. So it's gonna be, I think it will show up somewhere. I think it's still TBD, but that's a great point. Any other questions for Scott before we move on to NASHP's update? Okay. Well, I wanna just, I wanna turn the, the floor over um, for the last few minutes of the session to um, Kitty Purrington at NASHP. Um, to give their update, I can just tell you that without, without our NASHP colleagues, um, we would so not be where we are today. So thank you and Kitty, I'll let you um, take it away. Kitty, are you on mute? I think Kitty might have some audio concerns. Let's, okay, I think that might be her returning. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Of course, at a critical moment, I lost my connection. <laughs> Can everyone hear me? Yes. Hi. So. Hi. Mm -hmm. uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Kitty Purrington, and um, nice to see everybody's faces and hear voices. Um, I'm just going to provide a very brief overview of NASHB and the work that we're doing to support the efforts of the RAISE Act Council. Um, before I talk a bit about our work, I did want to just note that the NASHB, um, the NASHB has a great team on this project, and many of you already know Wendy Fox Grage, who is leading NASHB's work on the RAISE Act, and uh, we also have Salam Tashal and Paige Spradlin, who are the other members on our team, and just wanted to recognize that the work uh, I'll be talking about is really a reflection of their collective efforts. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so just a little bit of background on the National Academy for State Health Policy. NASHB was founded over 30 years ago, and uh, our mission is really bringing state health policymakers together to identify solutions and innovative approaches to complex policy issues. And that has continued to be our primary mission to this day. We're really um, dedicated to helping states across the political spectrum achieve excellence in state health policy and practice. And we focus our work on identifying practical solutions to some of the complex issues that state policymakers face. And we do this across a range of policy domains. So we look at Medicaid, healthcare coverage and access, public health, uh, the needs of people with complex and chronic healthcare needs. So we really have a, a, a wide lens that uh, we're looking through at state health, state health policy. Um, next slide, please. Are the slides moving? Hi, Kitty. Um, it doesn't look like we have those two. Oh, okay. That's fine. We can just keep going. So we, um, Nashville prides itself on really our ability to work across uh, 
really work on a nonpartisan basis. So we connect with state leaders uh, across the political spectrum and uh, approach our work understanding that one size definitely does not fit all for state health policy. And our work is guided by an academy of state health officials who are also from a range of states, red, blue, urban, rural, and uh, diverse government agencies. So again, I think one of the key strengths that we bring to the, to the field is our ability to work across agencies and state government, and particularly when identifying the needs of complex populations, needing to look at behavioral health, Medicaid, long-term care, what have you, um, it, can, can be a, it can be a particularly helpful way to approach some of these problems. So as you heard from Scott, we have been very fortunate to receive funding from the John A. Hartford Foundation to assist in the very important work of the RAISE Act Council. Um, through this work, Nashby has been able to develop the RAISE Act Family Caregiver Resource and Dissemination Center. And the center supports a number of different activities associated with the, the RAISE Act work. Um, first, we're able to work closely with both the foundation and the fantastic team at ACL to support the council and subcommittees as they craft their policy recommendations. We also are able to convene experts and thought leaders to contribute their perspectives on the work through the RAISE Act faculty. And we're also supporting state policymakers in their efforts to support family caregivers through uh, research, analysis, looking at emerging innovations that states are doing to support family caregivers. And so through all of these different pieces of work that we're doing, the center is really our way to disseminate um, information to a broad audience that includes our core audience of state policymakers, but also media, the public, and, and, and other stakeholders. So in the materials, we do have a screenshot of the RAISE Family Caregiver um, website that Nashby hosts on our website. And I encourage you all to take a look at that and um, explore the growing list of materials that we have there. I wanted to just flag a couple of recent publications that we have. Um, some materials developed to support the council's deliberations as well as some materials that share policy activity uh, with our state audience, state policymaker audience. So we recently posted an inventory of key family caregiver recommendations. Um, that work was a result of a really exhaustive review and synthesis of recommendations from over 800, uh, 800 distinct recommendations that were called from 27 key family caregiver reports. And these reports were state, national, as well as international. Um, and the recommendations were compiled and analyzed and have been um, organized to align with the RAISE Family Caregiver Council's work to uh, provide a really solid foundation about the, of the work that's gone before and um, give good food for thought to the, to the committee as they, as they are doing their work. Um, Nashby also recently looked at Medicaid waivers and state plans uh, in every state in the country to see what states are doing through um, these various Medicaid authorities to support family caregivers. And based on this research, we recently published a map highlighting state supports for family caregiver training and education and counseling. So um, we have that piece up on the website and we'll also be publishing additional findings uh, as uh, you know, the months roll out, we, our work was uh, somewhat changed course a bit due to the COVID pandemic. Um, there's a whole lot going on around state waivers right now. So once things settle down a bit, we'll, we'll be able to publish additional findings that we um, have gleaned from, from that analysis. So Nashby is also engaging other partners in support of the RAISE Act work. Um, we've contracted with Leading Age, the Leading Age Center at UMass Boston with Community Catalyst and also with Advancing States to host a series of listening sessions that are gonna be, uh, un, uh, we're gonna be doing uh, over the next few months. And those listening sessions will provide, again, additional input and reflection and, and thinking from a range of stakeholders uh, that can, can contribute and inform the council's work. 
um, members, just to note, members of the council will receive invitations for these listening session, sessions and will have access to recordings if you are interested in listening into the listening sessions, um, if you're interested in uh, taking a look at those at your leisure after they happen, um, we'll also have access to the notes and materials from that work. So that is what we have been up to um, in our partnership with, with the foundation and ACL and in supporting the RAISE Act and happy to answer any questions and uh, um, thank you for the chance to provide the council with an update of the work we've been doing. Thank you, Kitty. And we will make sure that the, um, because obviously you had slides, somehow they, we got, they got lost in translation. So we will make sure that your slides are put into the, um, the master deck that we're using here. So then, then they will be available to everyone um, after the meeting. We will get that done um, All right. just as soon as we can. Um, questions for, for Kitty or Nashpee um, as to all of the work that they've been doing to really, really support um, the efforts of the council um, in getting the RAISE Act off the ground. Okay, no questions. Um, I can just, I just want to say again, thank you to the Johnny Hartford Foundation um, for supporting this work. Um, it is incredibly meaningful and um, it is adding a, a level of depth and richness to the discussion and to the work that I think will only in the end um, be of greatest benefit to family caregivers, um, you know, everywhere. So that concludes the update portion from the project and I'm really excited now to jump into the meat of the agenda um, and to hear from um, our first presenter. Wendy at Nashby, could I put you on the spot to just introduce um, Dr. Pamela Nadash very quickly? Um, sure. Before... Great, sure. thank you. I'm happy to do that. Um, we are so thrilled that we are working with um, UMass Boston, Community Catalyst and ET Consulting. And Pam and um, her has just done a fantastic job um, analyzing the public input uh, that we received um, for the RFI that went out at the beginning of the year. Um, they have hand coded the responses. We thought we'd be lucky to get a thousand responses. As you'll hear from Pam, we the response rate from the public from not only organizations but really uh, individual family caregivers they gave us such meaningful input so i'm going to just turn it on over to to dr nadash um pam take it away and thank you so much to you and your staff and all your great work thank you everyone hear me yay okay um yeah, so this has been a fantastic project. It's been so much fun reading through the RFI responses. Um, I'd like to once again give credit to Wendy for being such a great partner with this. The Nashby folks have been really great. Um, I'm also working with Eileen Kell, who is an independent consultant who has a long history in working on issues around LTSS. And I also want to give credit to my fantastic grad student who's been helping me with the analysis. Her name's Taylor Jansen. Okay, can we um, pull up the slides? Great, okay. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so I just wanna remind everyone about the context of this. As you know, we have the RFI. Um, a goal really is to get the perspective of people, just get a different slice of the population. Um, the RFI was open to organizations, to individuals as well. Um, we got responses from all those people and we really wanted to know about their experiences, but also um, very specifically what kinds of services, supports, and then also really focus on recommendations and policy as well. So we wanted to hear what people were interested in in terms of what kinds of changes could be made. And this was specifically meant to inform the RAISE, Raise Act Family Council. So next slide. All right, so just a reminder, again, there were um, two open-ended questions. First one was um, uh, one pressing uh, family caregiving need or concern I would like to see addressed is whatever, and then I would like to offer this specific recommendation. Then we also had uh, one close-ended question, um, which was a list of different uh, types of, um, well, I'll show you the list in a minute. Um, 
people also had the opportunity, there was a blank where they could fill in the organization with which they were affiliated. This ended up being really useful to us as analysts um, because uh, people identified themselves as individual family caregivers or as affiliated with an organization. We had 1,613 uh, responses. And just as a reminder, all of this information was collected before the whole COVID crisis uh, really hit public consciousness. So we always have to kind of bracket the responses and remember that. Next slide, next slide, please. All right, so this gives you an idea of who the respondents are. And really the key thing that I want you to focus on is the fact that 75% of respondents were in fact individual family caregivers. And just so you know, um, there was the organization um, uh, uh, blank where people could put in their organization. Many people self-identified as family caregivers, but we also had, again, my fantastic RA went through and individually coded uh, uh, people who did not put an entry in there. And very often you could tell from the response, it was a family, it was an individual, and she coded that up. So we're pretty confident about that coding. Okay, next slide, please. So these were the responses to the close-ended questions. And I don't know about how your screen's looking at it, but it's a little bit small. Um, I think the big takeaway here was, I think the natural question that most of us would ask when we think about um, what priorities are is we might think that family caregivers might have a different take on things than the organizations that they're, that the, the people who are responding on behalf of organizations. And the kind of interesting thing is there's very little difference here. When I split it up in terms of caregiver respondents, I mean, there's virtually no difference. Um, so just looking at the list of responses, um, these were the um, categories that were given to people and they, had, they could check all, they could say, this was important to me. Um, so they could, were able to have multiple responses and you can just see how, um, how those responses played out. Uh, service planning was the top uh, response, most frequently um, uh, um, checked response, uh, uh, family-centered care, respite was third, uh, care transitions or coordination. Financial security, oddly enough, was uh, uh, a little bit lower down. Um, so I kind of, um, the, the, the um, Results of my analysis of the qualitative responses, the open-ended questions had a slightly different priority uh, assigned to them. So we'll just move on to that and we can discuss the extent to which they agree. I do wanna point out that um, it was great that we had respondents who were from a variety of different backgrounds and had a variety of different perspectives. We had all different kinds of caregivers responding, which is fantastic. Um, I am a person, I'm in a gerontology department, so my uh, focus tends to be more on the aging population, but we had a, a lot of different experiences represented there. Um, so we have uh, caregivers who are themselves aging, including the uh, grandparent population. We had a lot of respondents who were talking about the experience of living in a rural area and how hard that was. People mentioned long distance caregiving, people mentioned different racial and ethnic backgrounds, there were very few cases where uh, people talked about um, children who were caregivers. Uh, and they cared for a whole bunch of different types of populations as well, adults and um, older adults with care needs, children or um, adult children uh, with mental health needs that came up a lot, uh, people with dementia and children with special health care needs. Next slide. Um, so the biggest impression I got from all of this is the overwhelming um, concern and worry over financial issues and, and financial security. The respondents talked a lot about how worried they were about their personal finances and their future financial security. Um, and, and this kind of breaks down into two components. Uh, the fact that they were worried about being able to provide all the support they needed to the care recipient to get, be able to afford whatever it is that person needs, but also the impact on themselves in their own life. 
um, their ability to live their life the way they would want, um, and also thinking about the future, just worried about retirement and ongoing, the ability to continue on as they are. Um, a lot, and that fits in very neatly with the next point, which has to do with, I can't work. Um, providing care has meant that it's much harder, much more stressful for me to continue working. I had to stop working. Um, and then also the impact, again, on the financial future. I'm not, um, quali I'm, I'm worried about being able to qualify for Social Security. My Social Security is going to be lower. All of that worry. Um, and so the single recommendation that people were making had to do with simply pay family caregivers. I want some kind of financial recognition of the impact this is having on me. Um, and some of them requested uh, tax benefits, social security credits, next slide please. Oh, it's interesting, you know, and you could spend a lot of time reading this slide, but what was interesting to me was um, how very detailed people were in terms of the recommendations they made about what kinds of financial support they wanted. And so it ranged from things like quite specific uh, tax credits. People talked about the earned income tax credit and so forth. Um, people talked about tax deductions for the uh, purchasing uh, supplies that they needed in order to support their family caregiving. Um, they talked about um, uh, supplemental retirement income for um, caregivers through Social Security. They talked about uh, Social Security credits. Uh, so there, there, it was, uh, there was a lot of variety and richness in terms of the types of things they were asking for. And I think this is something that the council is going to have to think about because there are many different mechanisms for providing financial support to family caregivers. Everything from, I wish my state Medicaid program paid me, um, to all these other kinds of recommendations that were being made. Um, and then there were just the very heartrending kinds of comments about the impact this had on people's uh, physical and mental health. You know, I'm just so worried about this. It's, it's just stressing me out and I worry every day about it. So I, I think we wanna, you know, respect all of those different types of responses, everything from, you know, the emotional impact to uh, these very diff uh, specific recommendations about uh, changes. Okay, next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so again, uh, so I've talked a lot about caregiver pay, people getting some kind of financial recompense. Um, I also want to talk, people also link that very closely with the ability or inability to work. Um, so they talked a lot about how providing uh, support uh, to a family member made it really difficult for them to work or, um, you know, it either preventing them from working entirely, making them less good at work, making it much stressful, much more stressful for them to work. Um, and then this then linked to the need for services. So people talked a lot about respite. So respite was probably the biggest service. If you think about a specific service that was requested, um, that was the top service uh, mentioned. And I wanna, you know, be very clear. There were services for people, for the, the caregiver themselves, and then there were services for the care recipient. And these are two different categories of things. So respite kind of um, overlaps in that sense because you have the idea of respite, I just need some time off, I need a break. Um, and then you also need, uh, you think about it in terms of um, um, uh, I need services so that I can work. Uh, and adult day was actually mentioned quite a lot uh, as a form of respite, but also as a potential way for people to ha have support uh, for a family member while they were working. But it was often mentioned that adult day isn't really set up that way. You know, it's from nine to three and who can work if you have adult day that only goes from nine to three. Um, and then there was a lot of comment about the need for workplace protections. People mentioned FMLA, paid time off. They mentioned the need for flexible, uh, flexible work environments. They mentioned uh, the need for part-time options. Next slide. Thank you. Um, 
And then, you know, as you might expect, there was a lot of conversation about um, the uh, emotional and physical impact, the worry about the financial circumstances, the, will, the concern about whether I'm going to be able to continue providing care. Uh, there was a lot of conversation about mental health, um, and that goes in a number of different categories. It goes in the category of the care recipient who requires mental health supports and how hard that is to get. That, that was just talked about a lot. Um, and I think it reflects um, the fact that our, our healthcare system isn't well designed in terms of delivering those services, but also the need for care, uh, family caregivers to get mental health services themselves. Um, and then of course the impact on physical health. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so the demand for services for uh, family caregivers was very high. Again, respite, um, people talked about uh, it not being affordable. They talked about the quality. Um, people did say they uh, did mention caregiver assessment specifically, the fact that they needed to have their needs assessed and that and then there's other component which had to do with family caregivers being integrated into the care planning process, being taken seriously as an expert in the um, care of, of the care recipient. People talked about the need for education and training, um, uh, especially um, people who had um, care recipients who had complex medical conditions. So the concern, the worry about being able to support those people appropriately and then there was more, uh, a lot of uh, need for the more information and advice kind of category, like where do I find services? How do I navigate the, um, the, the system? Uh, you know, how, if I have a problem with filling out forms, you know, how do I get help with that? So uh, there's that category as well. Um, again, I mentioned support for fam uh, caregiver mental health needs, and then also social support. I wish I had somebody to talk to who shared my experiences. I feel really lonely, um, you know, th that whole kind of category. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, the other thing I was uh, very much impressed by was the extent to which people were um, so worried about, uh, well, obviously access to services obviously the affordability of services, but also um, they, talking a lot about direct care workers specifically and, the fa and really linking together quality, um, uh, quality and uh, training and low pay. Essentially people would, were, would, were very explicit in saying, well, there are never gonna be enough workers out there unless they get paid better. Um, they're not going to be, and, and, and I'm not going to trust leaving my family member with these people unless I know that they are well-trained and they're not going to be well-trained and they're not going to be high quality unless they get paid better. And there just won't be enough supply. I mean, people were really aware of how all those things link, link together and they explicitly linked them together. Um, Again, I, I mentioned this point before about the lack of services for children and adults with mental health needs. Uh, and then there was a, also a lot of stuff around, um, you know, providers don't understand the needs of the care recipients. Um, you know, everywhere from, uh, you know, my PCP doesn't understand dementia really and can't really help me uh, to uh, the provide, you know, the direct care worker doesn't really understand you know, what my daughter with autism needs. So, um, you know, so it spanned the whole um, spectrum there of not really understanding the specific needs of the care recipient. And people feel this feeling that providers were poorly trained in understanding um, these needs. Okay, next slide. Um, yeah, so, and then there were a whole bunch of other topics. As you might imagine, the amount, I, I, I could have told, I could spend hours talking about these results, right? And, and, and what was in there because, and, and many of these are I'm sure things that you guys know so well and so intimately that it's just repeating what you already know. So what I'm doing here is really highlighting, um, you know, what I think is important for you to know, but there's a lot more in there, of course. Uh, but some of the other topics were this desire for inclusion as a care partner and all aspects of care. Um, 
it was interesting too. a lot of people, I, I suppose the people who responded to this are very likely people who are pretty clued up. So they did mention a lot about, we need more advocates. We need people to understand what being a family caregiver is and start to define themselves as family caregivers uh, so that then they can, you know, press for action on this and, um, re or, or even just not even press for action in a more political sense, but also just know that they need services or that these services are for them because they are a family caregiver and there are services for family caregivers and, you know, putting two and two together there, uh, which I thought was really interesting. Um, there was a lot of stuff on housing. You know, there, there was a lot of stuff about service delivery and service availability that I'm sure it's not surprising to anybody here, but uh, housing was mentioned a lot, home modifications, that kind of thing. Transportation, particularly for people who live in rural areas. So you would have things like a caregiver saying something like, "I one of the reasons I can't work is because the hospital is really far away and I need to take time off work to get my family member to the hospital but I live in a rural area and there's no public transportation, so that's my day gone. Um, there was some mention of um, advanced care planning and palliative care. That was fairly infrequently mentioned, I will say. Okay, next slide. All right, um, yeah, a need to heighten awareness of caregiving. Uh, people also talked about the need for research and evidence in terms of number one, making the case, number two, understanding which interventions are most effective uh, with respect to family caregivers. Um, and then of course, people wanted more funding for everything, more funding for to increase access, to improve quality, uh, and to make everything more affordable. And again, I could go into this in great detail, but I'll just leave it at that. And people did mention, again, system complexity and how to navigate it. Um, improvements in, in coordinating care and all, all of that. So, you know, I'm sure a lot of the things I've mentioned to you is, they're, they're no great surprise. None of this is new. But what is interesting is they really do confirm and match with um, the driver diagram that you guys developed and also a Nashby's inventory of recommendations. Uh, so they really confirm those the other interesting thing I think is the way in which this really um, indicates priority. And as I said, the priority to me that, that came out of this was really how the financial security component, that that was so overwhelmingly important to um, the respondents. Of course, I have to remind you that this is not a represent, representative uh, sample by any description, the people were self-selecting, they were smart enough to know that there was an RFI, and they were motivated enough to go to the web page and fill it out. So not, not um, representative at all. Um, so in summary, uh, there's an overwhelming level of concern about the financial impact of caregiving and the need for affordable, accessible respite. Okay, and next slide. All right, so the, the the RFI analysis was a specific um, activity, research activity under our, our, our contract. The next stage of this is the listening session component. And the whole, the plan was always to do the RFI analysis and have those results feed into the web-based focus groups so that we can establish the priorities for what we want to get out of that uh, web-based focus group. Um, so, that's what we're working on right now. We are currently um, finalizing um, a protocol for the focus group. Protocol is just a fancy word for you know the questions we're asking. Uh, we are recruiting um, participants. Two of the we're starting out with uh, four focus groups just as kind of a trial run. Uh, two of the focus groups are going to be aimed at um, uh, adult caregivers. Uh, I, I sort of felt reasonably strongly that people who are parents of either children or uh, adults um, uh, with needs are going to have a different set of issues than other types of family caregivers. So we're having two focus groups that are specific to parents 
and two for other types of uh, family caregivers. Um, once we've had those focus groups and we've seen how they go, we'll uh, calibrate and reset and decide how to move forward, obviously with your input. Okay, next slide. Okay, and then after these um, uh, 12 focus groups are conducted, we'll, we'll then move into the in-person listening sessions. And those are going to be um, convened by the Community Catalyst team. Um, and those are really are going to be different from the focus groups in that they are going to be with key stakeholders. Um, and the stakeholders can be different groups. I hope it's okay for me to say, Wendy, that probably one of those groups is going to be employers because a lot of what's come out of this has to do with what can workplaces do to support family caregivers. Um, but, you know, this is all to be decided. Um, one of them will be in Spanish again, so we capture uh, a different slice of the population. So I think, next slide, I think that's it. Discussion, yes, here we go. Uh, yeah, so what are the big takeaways? Um, you know, how, basically we open it up to you guys to um, hear what your responses are, what your, um, what your take on this presentation is and how you feel this ought to be shaping the focus groups and the listing sessions. Um, so take it away. Great. So council members, um, thoughts on, on just this very initial cut at the, um, the RFI. Um, I know Wendy and I, when we saw this at first, we're very, very excited. Um, but we're, we would welcome your thoughts and ideas, particularly around, I, I think, um, question number um, three, you know, what else would you like to learn from the, the information that's available? Any other, you know, cuts of the data that Pam could consider doing? I think we're, we're all ears for what your thoughts and ideas are here. This is Catherine Alicia Georges. One of the, um, and I'm, I'm trying to remember the, the chart where financial finances were, I think, number four was 39%. Is that it? But then when you talked about in talking with the family members, finances was this overwhelming and overarching piece. So I'm wondering, since services and, and programs were number one, did you see, where is the intersectionality of that? Because you yeah. can't get yeah. service and if you don't have the monies, you know, or if you're not eligible for Medicaid. So I was just um, not baffled, but uh, was, I guess I'm, I'm not surprised because we've had this discussion in the subgroups and, and some people weren't sure about finances, but I think Greg, that this clearly identifies and supports the issues around finances. What we can do about it? Well, I think we should push for the credits and all the other things that um, you know some advocacy groups are pushing for. Yeah, I mean, I think that some of that has to do with the fact that the finances it, it's about the ability to pay for services as well as, you know, so I think there's an overlap. If, if you didn't have to pay for respite or if you didn't have to pay for the cost of caring for people, then your finances would be better. So I, I, that's the only way I can kind of reconcile those things. But, you know, that's my assumption. I don't, you know, know if that's mm -hmm. true. I mean, I think that I think it's definitely true that you know the the costs that caregivers incur by purchasing or having to purchase or pay for the types of assistance that they need to maintain their loved one at home is is one aspect of the problem. But then when you also look at if they have to leave work or quit work or reduce their hours of work, um, it impacts them then further down the road. Um, they give up on retirement, you know, contributions to Social Security, pensions, what have you. And so it's sort of this double whammy of financial impact. Yeah. So true. Uh, Pamela, did you mention where the listening groups will be located as in what areas of the country or states? Uh, the focus groups, did you say? Sorry. Um, the, yeah. Sorry? The ones that are to be done, yeah. Yeah, all of that is going to be done online. Oh, all online. I'm sorry. Yeah, I yeah. so I, I probably should have talked about that a little bit more. Um, so I, I think in the last presentation I did to you, I, I did a whole spiel on 
um, how great online focus groups are. <laughs> and it actually has worked out wonderfully for us because, you know, that's what ended up happening anyway. So um, it's, it's really great <laughs> that we planned it that way. Uh, and, you know, the advantage is that people really can participate. It's particularly good, I think, for this specific population, family caregivers, because they don't have the ability to leave the house for four hours and travel someplace and participate in a focus group. So this is, I think, worked out really well. Um, somebody, I, I, I've just had now had a chance to look at the, um, I, I, I try not to read comments while I'm talking because it gets me distracted and Lord knows I don't need that. But um, somebody talked about how do we recruit? So um, Eileen, you're, you're, you're on here. Eileen's been the one who's been actually working with the, um, the, the vendor that's um, setting up the focus groups. So Eileen, do you want to talk about the recruitment process? Um, it, did I unmute myself successfully? You did. Yeah, I did. Okay, so our focus group partner is um, Focus Point Global, and they um, recruit nationally through pa a variety of panels, and um, we established a recruitment screener, which specifies the criteria of what we're looking for. The primary emphasis is on obviously the caregiving characteristics that we've established. We've developed that screener and worked with uh, the team at Nashby and had that reviewed by, by I believe by the council. Um, and as Pamela said, um, dividing that up between groups of, sorry, people with uh, parents who are caring for either young or, or adult uh, uh, children with, with disabilities. Um, and also um, groups uh, of all other kinds of caregivers. And we're also dividing the groups into a lower income education group and a higher because we don't want any intimidation factor. Sometimes when you have a quote, expert, you can't see me, maybe you can, I'm doing air quotes, uh, someone who feels, who, who gives an air of expertise uh, it tends to 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 take over conversation in the group. So the recruitment um, asks a lot of questions about some age uh, and balances for most of the demographic characteristics that are important um, so that we can get, it's not representation, but participation across a lot of demographic factors. Um, and the recruitment physically happens through an online survey that they fill out um, initially to get some of the demographics, but then there's a phone call, phone conversation to go over uh, the details of the ability to have the technology and more importantly, articulation and a level of engagement to make sure that, that this is someone who wants to focus on this topic, can sit for an hour in front of the screen, is comfortable and is willing to, to make this commitment. So, and then they finalize the, the time and day and what group the person fits into. Um, they call them back with reminders. Um, and then before the group, they do a test of their, um, and a tech person works with them on the, um, on the technical, connection issues and they, they always have a tech available to um, troubleshoot if somebody gets knocked off the, or has connection issues. Um, we've done this several times with virtual focus groups prior to this. It works great because you can get people from all over so um, you don't have to worry about traffic, parking, um, M&Ms. <laughs> ham sandwiches and then all those other nice focus group of entities. Thank you. That sounds great. And let me ask one more question, maybe a little bit further upstream of, because uh, it sounds like you all are working to make sure we have a good diversity of people represented, of caregivers represented. Um, so also often we, in the community, people say, we never hear anything about caregiving. You know, and then there's another group that says, oh, I'm on every caregiving group. So I guess, are there some efforts being made to reach out um, uh, to the larger public to make sure we get a good representation of people who maybe have not been heard in the past? Maybe that's not a good way of saying it, but no, no, reaching, that's, 
reaching mm -hmm. beyond the standard folks that are, fall into the traditional um, uh, affinity groups? That's, that's a good question. And I would like some guidance actually from the advisory group on this. We're, we're not going through the usual suspects. We're just hitting sort of a random swatch of the America, the adult population. So we're getting who we're getting, who has the, the time and the interest to participate. So we're not going to groups, but we are having trouble. Uh, it's a little slower to rec recruit the parents of children. Uh, and so we were thinking of going to um, groups that represent that population and doing the recruitment through that. And if there are groups that you feel are underrepresented, that, that we can do a recruitment through a group mechanism. Um, so I'd be open to that if you feel there's a group that, that's underrepresented. Um, and, and frankly, it would be easier to recruit people that way than just going to the random adult population and finding people who are caregivers who have the time to do this work. So um, I, I would love to, you know, hear more about that. We, 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 we were almost fully recruited for the first ones and the first one or the first four and they will be May 28th and June 1st, 2nd and 3rd. Um, so, um, but I would, but I would love to revisit the, this conversation about um, uh, other other ways that we could recruit so that we are very inclusive um, and uh, expansive about how how we pull our people in. And then the listening sessions won't be as limited. We have a lot of numbers. We have twelve sessions, but only six people in each. Um, the listening sessions can be much bigger but they also want to include some stakeholder groups that aren't caregivers, but might have some uh, relationship programmatically to caregivers. So um, in the end, we will, we will have had a lot of voices. Great, thank you. And, and this is Greg. I, um, I would throw out to, to Pam that, you know, if, and her, and her team on this, that, you know, at ACL, we would be more than happy to, connect you with folks on the on the disability side of ACL who have extensive connections with those with um, parents and and programs um, that serve you know younger individuals and children with disabilities and their families and so we have a, a pretty good you know entree into that community I was also mm -hmm. seeing in the chat that um, we may want to consider um, a focus group or a listening session around the needs of veterans um, yeah. caregivers um, and Linda Davis, who's the VA's representative to this council, has offered to help make those connections. And so um, I think that may be worth a, a discussion for one of the future groups that you're planning. I think that could be could prove incredibly useful as well. Yeah, yeah we could entertain a special group as long as mm -hmm. we don't have to find them at random. Sure. Because sure. that's that's incredibly costly and not exactly. something we price exactly. for. But okay. Um, yeah. That's good. Yeah, we can definitely explore further um, special groups and, and other ways that you might recruit. Okay. Can I just uh, mention, um, re remember, I, I, we mentioned it earlier, but you guys can all watch the focus groups. Um, there will be an ability for you to watch the focus groups and um, you can chat amongst yourselves. Now, again, for me, I will be moderating these groups and I cannot be distracted by reading all those chats. So what will happen is Eileen and, and Wendy, I think, will be um, monitoring what you guys are saying. And if there's something really important, they'll communicate it to me. Uh, and, you know, if you think I haven't picked up on something or whatever, we want to keep that to a minimum because, again, you know, it's, it's very distracting. It, it's hard moderating a focus group because, you know, you're trying to like be responsive to everybody, make sure everybody talks and all that. So I, I'm very kind of very focused when I do it. Um, but so you should be aware that that's going to be possible. Um, I do want to very quickly, because uh, I just had to fill out the IRB for these focus groups, uh, remember, remind you that these are all confidential and you shouldn't be uh, revealing anybody's personal information and all that. So if you do participate in this focus group, we have to respect the confidentiality of the folks who are doing it. So that's just a little 
legal reminder there. So, um, okay. Yeah, and, and as, as Pam said, um, the, all of the council members are gonna receive invitations to what we're calling our back room um, mm -hmm. to these. So you'll be able to, to sit in and, and hear the discussions as they're occurring. Um, and hopefully you can make you know, one or several of these as, they're, as they take place. And they will also be recorded. So mm -hmm. if you miss the um, actual event in real time, you will be able to look at it. And again, you know, we're going to give you the um, access information. And again, that should be very uh, strictly limited in terms of just you guys and not being passed around and so forth. It's password protected at entry and all yep. that because we, we do have a responsibility to, to protect the, the confidentiality of the people participating. Greg, this is, this is Nancy Murray. Can you yes. hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. So obviously as a family member of two adult children with intellectual disabilities, I'm um, very pleased that we are including um, families like myself. And I'm just thinking as the analysis goes forward, um, I'm wondering if we could um, take a look at maybe if there are some differences in, in um, stressors. If you looked at families of adult children with disabilities who have been caregivers for 20, 30, 40 years, and then we looked at caregivers um, maybe of a returning veteran, and, and now they've been a family caregiver for maybe five years. Um, if there are differences in the responses between, simply because of the length of caregiving. Yeah, I mean, the, the data set is so rich. Um, a lot of interesting work could be done in kind of looking at differences amongst different types of caregivers. That's a little bit mm -hmm. hard because people don't always identify exactly what kind of caregiver they are. Um, and, you, you know, it's, uh, you know, right now the analysis has been done, it's very purpose driven. You know, the purpose of what I did was to inform you guys, inform the report to Congress, uh, inform the focus groups. So there's, there's a lot could be, that could be taken from this. And I agree that length of caregiving is, is, is certainly one of the issues. I mean, I think the other thing that I mentioned was, you know, caregivers who are aging themselves, you know, and that, that constant concern about, you know, what's going to happen, right? I'm old, getting older. I can't do this anymore. I can't physically do it. I can't mentally do it. And what's going to happen to my kid when I, you know, can't mm -hmm. do this. Anyway, but that's a whole special set of issues. And uh, I don't know that we have the ability to delve into that. Well, we, we, are, we are asking, uh, we're looking for a balance and a range of ages for the, uh, for the parents that we recruit. And um, certainly encouraging them, whether they have young children or older children or adult children, um, so far for the first two groups that we've recruited, um, the ages range from 30 to um, 56. So we have a good range, but we don't have anybody that, you know, I, I don't know. It depends when they have their children, obviously, how old they would be. Some of them may be uh, obviously of an age where they're dealing with the issue of their child moving on to, um, you know, an out-of-home placement and the loss and the, you know, significant life change that that brings. Um, but, you know not not the kind of duration that you're talking about yet but perhaps we will i, I think it we, this may be more attractive for somebody who's kind of in the thick of it as opposed to having been through it but you never know uh, Pam? This is, i'm sorry oh and this is diane caridou and i was just wondering if um I was looking at slide five and six, because you know, asking what else you might look at. And although we saw all respondents and caregivers who are 75% of the respondents are pretty similar in um, to the close, you know, what was important to them. 
Did you do any analysis or is it possible to look at the caregiver responses by either who the caregiver was that, I mean, the categories, you know, like long distance or rural or the individuals that they're taking care of to see if it's consistent in all those groups or is there a variance that maybe we need to um, uh, address in uh, the final report? Yeah, again, that's a very detailed kind of analysis that would require people to have identified themselves as such. Um, and, you know, and, and we would have needed to code up the uh, responding category in that particular kind of way. And that's not always possible because people didn't always identify themselves as particular kinds. Of there was, yeah, there was know? no, there was no data collection. There, there was nothing demographic about the individual or their caregiving situation that was able to be included. So unless they put it into their story about their caregiving stress or experience, um, some people did, some people didn't. So A, it wouldn't be a complete picture, the analysis. We're hoping to get more of that from the focus groups. Um, but again, you know, neither is perfect. But we are asking about, for example, we're asking if people have, for, for the other caregivers, we're asking if they have children under the age of, of 18 at home, because that means they're, pretend, they're sandwich generation caregivers. Um, to get a sense of that. We didn't ask local or long distance, but we can get a sense of that. So we're hoping to bring up in a qualitative way some of those issues in the focus groups um, that you're describing. Greg, this is James Cheeley. Hey, um, yes. I'd, I'd like to go back to Mrs. George's original statement when we opened up this discussion in regards to financial impact. Um, and at the end of what she said, not that she needs any support or encouragement, but she mentioned the fact that this advisory panel can't back down in our report to encourage financial considerations to families. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I just wanna support that that we need to be bold, we need to step forward, and in our report, we need to be sure that we take steps um, to just highlight and, and make significant the financial impacts and opportunities that we might have to change for families. It's not just an immediate situation to families, but future situations as well. I wanted to mention in response to that question also that um, uh, on that closed category question, the RFI respondents were able to choose all that applied. And so I, we don't know what would happen if we said, what was, what's the most important or what are your top three, whether finance concerns would have risen. Um, you know, I'm sure there are so many concerns and so, um, one of the things we're hoping to do in the focus group is at the beginning of it, before people have even started to talk, present something similar to here are eight concerns that cover care and service domains and cover a variety of financial domains broken out specifically like uh, workplace concerns uh, with losing a job or not, you know, not having paid leave time, whatnot, um, not being paid uh, caregiver issue, paid caregiver issues, and ask people to pick their to top three and rank them so that we can, over the 12 focus groups, get some sense of priorities. And so we will see where you know, where some of those, and, and through the conversation, see where some of those financial issues fit, hit, hit for people and for whom they're uh, more um, pressing than, um, you know, we'll get some additional insights into that. So that, that, was, that was a concern because, because of the contrast that you saw between the comments and that closed category um, responses there that that kind of hit us as as a little odd as well. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, I think does Carol Zerniel have a question? I, I do have a question. Um, ask I'm, away. 
I'm curious because we've had the seismic shift with uh, COVID-19 and all of this work was done prior to the pandemic. Um, if this is going to be an opportunity, will there be new information that's allowed to be introduced? And, and then will there be a way to fine tune some of these concerns in light of COVID, you know, the impact of COVID going forward? Yeah, I mean, one of the big concerns about the focus groups is that the potential of this particular crisis to kind of completely take over. And um, so, so it's a really careful balance to be done in terms of how much do we acknowledge this crazy situation right now um, and the um, uniqueness of it and how much do we, um, you know, just, so, so we're, we're thinking about a number of different strategies in, in how to deal with this issue. So the first strategy is going to be to tell, actually Eileen was gonna, she, she was joking about, she wanted to get um, a picture of an elephant, you know, and like put it on the screen and tell people this is the elephant in the room. It would be one of the Zoom participants and then we would take it away <laughs> and we would start out and say, let's get the elephant out of the room. You yeah. know, we don't want to spend, you know, we, we know you're thinking about it every minute of the day, but this is going to be a COVID free zone until the end. We do want to come back because we know it's, it's making everything that's already challenging so much harder for all of us. And so we will come back to it and talk about it. But first we want to hear what your caregiver life is like, and then we'll come back. We will come back to it at the end. And we, we also have, when we've been doing the screener, made a similar acknowledgement where we said we know COVID is making everything crazy and you know is your situation such that you know the groups are not about COVID because we didn't want people to re not participate because they thought the last thing I want to do is is talk about it more so it's not about that um, but you know uh, and but we know your life is crazy because of all that or this you know there may be added stress do you think that you could, does, does your life circumstance permit you to be, to participate in this group at this time? We didn't want to be blind to it. So we think we're acknowledging it in the right ways um, and by knowing when to exclude it, when to include it. So um, you can see if you've, re you've reviewed the materials, how we're dealing with it. If you have any suggestions, we'd be open to them. But I think I think Nashby thinks we've hit the right notes, so we'll we'll see. Thank you. Okay. Any other last minute questions? We're we're surprisingly very on time with the agenda, which is great because we have a really um, another really interesting discussion coming up next. Um, I would offer this to the to the council members. Um, you know, we're very interested in hearing sort of what your burning questions might be, and I realize that sometimes those burning questions occur to us at like 11 o'clock at night. Um, so when we're not all gathered here. And so if you have other thoughts or ideas for how we may analyze the information, the data that we gathered through the RFI, um, send, the, send those ideas to Wendy and me and we can see if it's possible. I mean, you know, there are limitations to the work that Pam um, and her and her team can do. However, that's not to say that down the road we couldn't, you know, look at the data that we have and perhaps, you know, do some other analysis on it um, that may help inform the work of the council either more more in the immediate future or even further down the road for other activities that we may that you all may get involved in. So um, I throw that out to you as an option. If Ray, you have other. Yes. Hi, Greg. Oh, hey, Ron. I have a question or a, a suggestion in terms of <clears throat> the focus groups. I think it would be worthwhile to include a question very directly that asks, how has the COVID situation changed your experience? That way, I, I, I think there's a lot of things to be valued out of that because I think mm -hmm. there's <clears throat> new insights that caregivers have learned and map back to things that they usually have, but bring them out big, you know, higher mm -hmm. or more prevalent. But it also helps you kind of keep in mind 
which part of the situation is ongoing and, and how the COVID has actually changed things. So I think maybe a direct question would be helpful. Sure. And which could then, you know, the information that we would get from that could actually, I think, be extrapolated to, you know, any type of, you know, major emergency type situation, what to look for, potential changes to the caregiving experience that could be seen by programs or service providers and what have you, or even what caregivers should be on the lookout for. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Great. Thank you. Hi, Greg. It's Liliana. Can you yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I had just put in the chat, but wanted to also add um, for the listening sessions, I think one of the things is since you're looking at caregiving across the spectrum, to make sure that you're looking at providers that are working with all of these different groups. So providers be that like the medical community that's working with, um, you know, adults with dementia or with, you know, adults or children with special health, uh, mental health needs or special needs or like education staff. Um, and just wanted to make sure that as you're looking at the online focus groups, you're also looking at parents who have adopted children from foster care who we know have higher rates of mental health needs and special, special needs as well. Um, and if you need any help trying to reach out to those folks, we can connect you through um, ACS. Great. Thank you, Liliana. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, Pam, and uh, thank you all so much. This was really exciting to see. Um, you know, we had no idea really when we went into the RFI process and fielding it, what we would get out of it and how, and then much, then when we saw the tremendous response, it was like, boy, how do we begin to analyze this? And thank you. I mean, you just, the work that you all have done is phenomenal. And I think I, I think Wendy would agree. Um, that this is really, really will be useful information for the council. And we look forward to seeing the other work that you do with it. Great, thank you. Yes, thank I you. agree. Thank you so very much. And just as a follow-up, we will make sure that the listening information, listening sessions gets out to our council members. And the beautiful thing about this is it's gonna be a series of listening sessions. So we'll be able to debrief after the first four and then see how they went and make changes if need be for them going forward. So it's a great, it's, a, it's an iterative process as, as we move along and we will get those invitations out to the council members soon. All right. So moving right along, um, we are very pleased to have um, a wonderful friend and colleague, um, Lynn Feinberg from the AARP Public Policy Institute. Um, to talk with us about um, family leave um, issues and considerations. And as you saw from the RFI analysis, this clearly is on the minds of a lot of people, um, but also this whole issue of family leave and how we focus on that as, as, as the council focuses on that is going to be critical. And so um, we've asked Lynn to provide some insights and then we will have a similar discussion with Lynn that we just had um, with, with Dr. Nadash. So Lynn, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Greg. And um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good, okay. And I wanna thank you and Wendy for inviting me to be here today. I um, wish we could all be in person, but this is the best that we're gonna do. And um, again, I'm very privileged to be speaking with all of you who are doing such important work. I have, um, just by preface, I have worked on family issues for nearly 40 years now. And so it's personally and professionally rewarding for me um, as an advocate for family caregivers to see the extraordinary commitment and all the rich work that you're doing right now. So I thank you. Um, I've been asked to speak about family leave. So next slide, please. So why is family leave important? Well, because unlike previous generations, most family caregivers today work at a paying job. In fact, there are about 29 million family caregivers who are working, um, typically full-time. 61% of family caregivers work. Almost three in four, 72% of younger family caregivers, ages 18 to 49, are employed. And more than two-thirds of those age 50 to 64 are also working at a paying job, juggling work and caregiving. And the majority, nearly two thirds, have made one or more workplace accommodations. 
The data that you're seeing now are really hot off the press. They're from our new study with the National Alliance for Caregiving, an AARP that released caregiving in the US 2020 uh, last week. And I think Grace Whiting is on the phone uh, now on the webinar. CEO of the National Alliance for Caregiving, this has been just a terrific partnership. Um, I would also say that about half of working caregivers who left their jobs said that they did so to spend more time in caring for their relative or close friend. Next slide, please. Now, um, as we've been talking about, um, Pam's presentation was really an important segue because Pam was talking about the RFI analysis and the financial issues that were paramount. Well, we know that family caregivers who stop working can really face substantial short-term and long-term financial risks. Things as um, Greg was suggesting, caregivers can lose income, health insurance, social security and retirement benefits, and also career opportunities if they have to quit a job to give care or reduce their work hours. There is evidence that caring for a parent in midlife may substantially increase a woman's risk of living in poverty in old age. This is a very serious issue that we will talk about as we continue this discussion, especially in light of the pandemic today. And then many employed family caregivers don't have access to any paid sick days or any paid family leave benefits at work or they may not be eligible for the unpaid protections of the Family Medical Leave Act. Next slide, please. So let's just start with just a few basic definitions, if I may. First, paid sick days, because it's called different things by different organizations and individuals. It's also known as earned sick days and paid sick leave, paid sick time, generally limited to a number of hours or days, typically, from um, anywhere from three to eight days that allow workers to stay home when they're sick with a short-term illness like the flu or now with COVID-19, to accompany a family member to a medical appointment or to take limited paid hours or days off to provide care for sick family members. Family leave, on the other hand, is generally described as longer time off, either unpaid or paid, to care for a seriously ill or chronically ill family member. And family leave generally also includes parental leave to care for a new child or an adopted child. Next slide, please. So um, let me begin with the Family and Medical Leave Act that was enacted in 1993, 27 years ago now. Um, this was the first federal law to recognize the dual demands of work and caregiving. And it established worker rights of up to 12 weeks of unpaid but job protected leave when you have a new child or adopt a new child to care for oneself because of a serious health condition, to care for certain ill family members, specifically a child, a spouse, or a parent or to care for a military service member with a serious illness or disability. It applies to private employers with 50 or more employees and public sector agencies. But only 60% of the workforce are eligible for FMLA protections because not all workers are eligible and small employers are exempt from the law. Sometimes a worker um, may wanna take unpaid family leave through the FMLA, but the person he or she is caring for is not covered under the law, and people don't know about this. So for example, if you have a brother with cancer and you want to take time off to care for him, or a grandmother with Alzheimer's, for example, you're excluded from the Family and Medical Leave Act. It also excludes people's chosen family, including a partner or a close friend. Next slide, please. So to make up for this gap, nearly one in three states exceed the minimum requirements of the Family and Medical Leave Act, 14 states in DC. Um, and they do this in three main ways. 
covering workers and businesses with fewer than 50 employees, the small employers, providing a more inclusive definition of an eligible family member that could include a domestic partner or grandparents, parents-in-law or siblings, and also expanding the FMLA use provisions to allow workers to take family members to medical appointments, which is especially important for employed family caregivers. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows the reasons for taking FMLA leave. And contrary to popular belief, workers who take FMLA leave do so to care for their own health issues. Over half of workers that have taken FMLA leave do so because they were ill or sick, followed by a new child, 21%, and then 18% for caregiving leave. The most recent study, the most recent federal study, I should say, of the FMLA showed that about 16% of all eligible workers use the FMLA during the past year. So not a huge percent, really. People only take this leave if they really, really need it uh, to care for someone um, who needs help. Now, some workers are still unaware of the FMLA 27 years after its enactment, and it's especially workers who are younger, low income, or multicultural who have the least awareness of this federal benefit. And unpaid leave also creates financial hardships for many working families who need a paycheck and really disincentives for using the FMLA. A 2017 survey found that about half or 46% of FMLA workers who needed family leave but didn't take it said that they didn't take the leave because they needed, they needed a paycheck. They cited lack of pay as the reason for not using the benefit. Next slide, please. Now, we know in the world that we're living in right now that COVID-19 has clearly raised awareness of the need for access to paid workplace leave policies in the United States. The media um, really has um, done um, a big service, I believe, in uh, raising these issues with many, many um, really heartbreaking stories. The United States is the only high wealth nation without some guaranteed benefits to paid sick days or paid family leave for all workers. But starting in October of 2020, federal workers will have access to 12 weeks of paid leave following a child's birth or adoption of a child, but it excludes workers that are caring for ill family members. It's just for parental leave. Now there is um, a range of research showing that providing workers with access to workplace leave policies can reduce the strain of caregiving, can provide employed family caregivers with greater financial security. As we heard, this is a huge theme from the family caregivers themselves through the RFI, especially low wage workers. Paid family leave and other leave can reduce older adults' nursing home utilization. We'll come back to that in a moment. It can increase employee retention and help maintain a productive and a healthy workforce. So in 2018, um, researchers at Syracuse University looked at the effect of California's paid family leave law on nursing home utilization. This was the first study to examine long-term services and supports outcomes associated with paid family leave. It's a really important study. And they found that the use of paid family leave by employed family caregivers in California showed an 11% reduction in older adults nursing home utilization. So what this means is that by making it financially easier to take time off and the peace of mind to be able to care for someone that you love, seriously ill um, at home and in the community really um, is a win-win for all and really deferred um, or postponed nursing home utilization. So that was an important finding. The next slide, please. Now there are um, two new federal laws that address paid time off for some workers due to the pandemic. But big gaps remain. I'm not going to go over all the details in this slide. Uh, we're still in process. There may be another federal 
um, uh, it may be legislation um, from the House that goes to the Senate that deals with some aspects of workplace leave policies. Both of the bills here um, went into effect on April 2nd and expire on December 31st, 2020. But they leave out 60 million workers and family caregivers have less access to paid leave than others in these two pieces of legislation. Um, the new laws also create confusing eligibility and again, leave out many who need it. The next slide, please. So from the private sector, there are some employers that voluntarily do offer the option of paid family leave benefits, but only 19% of civilian workers do have access to paid family leave through their workplace. Low wage workers, young adults, many of whom are family caregivers, multicultural workers, and those who work in small businesses are the least likely to have paid family leave. Most of the private sector policies and programs for paid family leave is currently limited to parental leave. Over the past few years, we've seen really an uptake of um, well, now, well over 100 brand name companies that have voluntarily adopted or expanded their paid family leave policies in their companies like Amazon and Starbucks um, and Walmart. But only one in five or 20% offer paid family leave for caregiving needs. Most just cover new parents. And most private sector leave policies don't offer an inclusive definition of family beyond a sick child, an ill spouse, or a parent, or cover other relationships like grandparents or siblings or someone's chosen family. Next slide, please. So in the absence of comprehensive federal policy, states really are leading the way to enact paid family leave programs. And thus far, we have eight states in the District of Columbia that cover family caregivers with their paid family leave benefits. Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Oregon are the three new states um, that have enacted paid family leave programs, but the benefits have not yet begun. They're gonna begin next year or the year after. These eight programs and the District of Columbia differ in terms of their eligibility requirements and all of the uh, factors that I have here on the slide, including the maximum length of paid leave, whether uh, the benefit provides job protection or not, and how the program is funded. Utilization of these paid family leave programs in the states is relatively low, but it's climbing. So um, an analysis of the claims in the states for family care from the first three states that enacted paid family leave, California, New Jersey, and Rhode Island, show that in California, New Jersey, it was about 12 to 16 percent of claims were for family caregiving needs. In Rhode Island, the percentage is a little higher, 23 percent. In part, that's probably because at the time that these data were collected, Rhode Island was the only one of these three states that has job protected paid family leave. California and New Jersey did not, although New Jersey has amended their law and they do now have job protection. So the main barriers to workers using these policies are lack of awareness among their employer that they're even eligible for these programs limited wage replacement for some programs, again, lack of job protection, and social stigma and workplace culture that really doesn't value and support time off for family needs. Next slide, please. And states are also leading the way to enact paid sick days laws that cover family caregivers. Um, as with paid family leave, current federal policy doesn't require employers to offer not even one day of paid sick day as an employment benefit for all workers. And if ever there was a time when this is just front and center for all of our lives, it's right now. More than one in four, 27% of workers have no paid sick days at their jobs. And this is especially true of low wage workers and so service sector workers who we know are the most adversely hit now during the pandemic. 
13 states and the District of Columbia do mandate paid sick days. And some states have recently amended, expanded, or passed new laws due to COVID-19. And there are at least eight state, legislature, state legislators, state legislatures, excuse me, across the country that are now debating and considering paid sick leave bills in response to the pandemic. Next slide, please. So this slide um, really just shows you and gives you access to two links. One is a report that we did at the AARP Public Policy Institute uh, two years ago that um, really highlights paid family leave benefits in the states that were the early adopters of such benefits and really reviews the research on the topic. And then an article that was published in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society that, that encourages clinicians for the family members of their patients to let these family members know about benefits in the states and businesses that provide them so that family caregivers will know how to access benefits if they need them. Next slide, please. So just a few takeaways and then we can, I'm happy to answer any questions. As we've talked about this issue, we know that managing paid work and caregiving is a challenging balancing act, financial hardship, an emotional roller coaster, and a health risk too. And supportive workplace benefits that help workers remain in the workforce and continue caring for ill family members are really win-wins all around for the employer to keep a valued employee working, for caregiving families, both the person who's ill or has a disability, as well as the family member and society as a whole. Paid sick leave and paid family leave policies are a sound investment. The majority of employers that have been surveyed in states that have enacted paid family leave programs have not experienced negative impacts on their business. And there's a rich and growing literature on this to show these um, really neutral impacts. And workers should not have to choose between keeping their jobs and providing care to a serious ill family member. As um, COVID-19 transforms so much of our society in so many unexpected ways, I would suggest that in the immediate future, there may be fewer family caregivers in the labor force due to job loss and greater caregiving demand, something that I hope that you will think about. The concern is also that when employers, especially small employers, restaurants, um, 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 home care agencies, that may choose to rehire, when they do choose to rehire, that they may choose to hire workers who don't have caregiving demands. I'd like you all to think about that. Now, it is not illegal to discriminate against someone because they're a family caregiver. Federal Equal Employment Opportunity laws explicitly prohibit employers from discriminating against employees based on sex, race, religion, disability, national origin, and age, but it does not explicitly prohibit discrimination based on caregiving status. So that might be something, what's known as family responsibility discrimination or caregiver discrimination that at another time, when you're thinking about the recommendations for financial security that you take that into consideration. So I'll end there, thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. Uh, that was really, it was enlightening and um, also just tons of great information. So we have some discussion questions up here that of course we provided to the council members um, ahead of time. And we also, Lynn, I think sort of covered many of these. So I wanna throw it open to um, our council members for questions or an opportunity to um, discuss with Lynn um, anything that you have on your mind or what what have you. So we'll we'll open it up and just feel free to weigh in. Don't forget to unmute yourselves. Questions for Lynn. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Mm -hmm. um, this is James Murtha. 
Yes. Um, thanks a lot, Lynn, uh, for this. This is really helpful. Um, I was curious, um, uh, across your research, did you find possible uh, propo like proposals of possible ways to address this that aren't currently in play? Um, in terms of financing? Well, you... I guess, you know, anything, like in terms of incentivizing states to enforce and incentivizing businesses, like maybe through like tax cuts or things like that to provide um, provide more like leave coverage. I don't know. Just like I'm curious, like right. if you had if you had collected, you don't have to like talk about it at length. Yeah. But I was just curious if that came up because that could um, help with talking points in the future. Sure. Well, the two newest bills that deal with paid leave or paid sick leave for COVID are tax credits. That's how employers are getting reimbursed. Okay. But for the paid family leave programs. Um, that have been enacted in the states, there's either a payroll tax on the employee, the employer, or a combination of the two. Those are the typical ways of funding a family leave. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other thoughts, um, you know, council members, as we've, as you all have been considering your work on on our on the driver diagram and on recommendations that that you, you're thinking about you know need to be included in the in the report or actions and, and programs for this national strategy are there takeaways that you have from Lynn's presentation that you heard that you know we may that we may need to get, take down and get captured so that we can begin thinking about them more seriously hi Greg this is Deborah Hey. Um, Stonewalls. I, I have some thoughts, especially about um, the number three item about Family Medical Leave Act and expansion and how it, it could be expanded. And Lynn, I know you touched on a few of those um, area or a few of the groups of folks. It has always stupefied me a bit about why FMLA doesn't include grandparents, um, why it doesn't include grandchildren when so much of, of the care that, that is provided um, at a, in a time of serious illness or disability does occur between those two groups. We see a lot of grandchildren taking care of grandparents and we see a lot of grandparents taking care of grandchildren. Um, so I, I would, well, that's, I think that that would be one way we could look to expand FMLA. Thank you, Deborah. And I think, you know, as we're looking ahead to tomorrow's session at the end of the meeting where we're going to be digging into the, to our driver, driver diagram yet again, I would, I would encourage you all to make some notes for yourself about where, you know, so if you have something particular around FMLA and how it should be expanded or, or where it should expand to, or specific actions that states could take versus the federal government could take, that employers could take, come prepared to share these because that's how we're going to make some real progress in beginning to shape what the strategy looks like and what the ultimate recommendations turn out to be. Um, and so, you know, Deborah, I think what you, what you did was you raised a great point. I think we have an opportunity there to make sure that we've incorporated that into the work we're doing. Greg, this is Casey. I'm not sure if, are you able to hear me okay? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. I've really struggled with my internet connectivity today. So uh -huh. I apologize. I'm keeping my video off and that seems to at least help me stay connected. Um, I just wanted to raise a couple of points that I think are important for us to think about as we move into tomorrow's work, especially, um, you know, I really appreciated, Lynn, the, 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 um, the points about some states are doing this better than others. And so I just wonder, you know, and, and I know from my own perspective, I, I, I don't see 
um, what I, I don't know that we have things that are necessarily different in operations in Oregon than necessarily other states. And so in terms of FMLA, we have a, a, a much better um, uh, set of structures that we operate from with FMLA than what happens in other states. And so I just think about how can we leverage the strengths that some states have in helping to inform the conversations, the, the proposals for legislation, things that can happen in other states. So I just wanted to point that out there. Um, and so I just really, really appreciated that perspective in helping me to see, again, that there are some things that Oregon does well. Um, there are other things that Oregon does not do well. So um, I think just pulling on the strengths of different states is important. And then I also think it's really important that we do touch on um, the societal views of how people are viewing family and sick leave in relation to COVID-19. There, there is already so much stigma and, and negative um, ideology around family caregiving, around um, you know, the, what it means to be a family caregiver. And now there is another layer of stigma coming over people um, who've tested positive for COVID-19, who have recovered from COVID-19. And so I just think that it's another really important piece that we think about um, the importance of lifting up family caregivers in the role that they have. And just having that in our sites that, that the stigma of what it means to be a caregiver um, and, and not having access to necessarily adequate supports or um, services and the stigma of what people are facing with having, um, you know, positive COVID-19 diagnoses, those might um, amplify what we're seeing in terms of stigma. Very important okay. point. Mm -hmm. right. Absolutely. And, and Casey, I would encourage you, as I as I said, I think tomorrow as we as we dive into, you know, looking at where we are with things on that on that driver diagram you may want to bring those points back to the discussion to make sure that we it, get them dropped in there or, you know, reach out to Wendy and me afterwards to make sure that we have things um, included so that we don't miss anything. Absolutely. Thank you. And, uh, Greg, this is Kitty. I just wanted to um, chime in that that's something that uh, Nashby can bring to the discussion where we see states and state policies that are very supportive or best practices and represent innovations, um, we're really well positioned to mm -hmm. um, you know, compile those and share them with other state policymakers who are looking for ways to support caregivers. Um, and so I think that's one way that's really effective for state policymakers to learn from each other. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Other questions or thoughts? Um, yeah. that you, yes. Uh, Greg, this is Alan. I have a question for Lynn. Um, Lynn, um, thank you for the great presentation and all the, uh, the passion and long-term career work that you brought to this issue. So, and thank you for sharing it with us today. Um, and, and, and it seems like, you know, you make a very good case for um, paid leave. I think sometimes though, we also need to think about who are, who's opposed to this? Who's, who would we be challenged by if we try to move this forward? And what is the rationale or the policies or uh, the financial models? What, what's the flip side of this that we should be aware of that I think would be important to how we strategically move this forward? Well, I think you raise a good point because we don't yet have a paid family leave program in the country. So there are some that are not supportive. Um, but the research is fairly clear. And when you talk to employers, um, even small employers, there is really negligible impact on a company if someone, just even taking paid sick days, and we're only talking about maybe five days during the year, separate from the longer paid family leave. Um, also, there's been more research even beyond um, our report, the Families Caring for an Aging America report, that um, other employers are getting engaged now and recognizing that over the next five to 10 years, family caregiving across the lifespan 
it's going to become an even more important issue in businesses because people have to go to work and yet they're still providing care for an ill family member or somebody with a disability. So I think um, as you think about doing some of your focus groups, and I, I think I heard Pam um, or Eileen say that you might be doing something with employers. You might even think about doing it with small employers where I think there is more resistance because there's just not a lot of other workforce individuals to take the place of somebody if someone is out of work. And the other, other thing to think about with paid family leave is um, depending on the industry or the type of company that somebody's working in, it may be easier or harder when one person, one staff person, one employee is not there for about a month. So those are the issues that um, would be good to be able to break down a little bit more to understand what are the opportunities to um, make it a win-win for everyone. I hope that answered your question. Uh, yes, and can I, if I follow up and um, maybe uh, if this is getting too specific, please just uh, redirect me. Um, but you, you did bring up that several states have moved forward with these types of programs. Um, from our perspective of hoping to, for this advisory council to, uh, to develop a, a strategy that we would hope to be a federal or a, a strategy can you can you talk to the issue of what is the best path forward for this topic is it a state by state path or is it a federal path or is it both could be both i think uh, different entities look at it in a different way um, at AARP, I'll just speak to AARP and our Public Policy Institute. As many of you know, we produce a long-term services and support state-by-state -state scorecard every few years. Our newest edition will be coming out in the coming months. Part of a high-performing long-term services and supports system is support for family caregivers. And we point out in these long-term services and support scorecards, if you will, that part, only you know, one way of supporting family caregivers is through the workplace protections. There are other areas, of course, that are equally as important, providing respite care, assessing, identifying and assessing a family caregiver's needs. But by putting out these state scorecards, other states see, as Kitty was saying, what other states are doing and that is one way to influence policy, I believe, at the state level. But I will Thank say, you. and again, I'm speaking for myself now and not with my organizational hat on. If there was ever a time when it's front and center the need to allow workers to take some time off to care for an ill family member, Part of the culture of care, the United States should step up to the plate. I, I totally agree. And, and, and me. That was me at, speaking personally. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank you for that uh, personal comment, Len. Um, but let me also add in, I think very often we um, tend, to, own, tend to, to think of caregiving as a long-term um, event. Um, and we also know, especially I think this crisis has brought up the importance of understanding that sometimes family caregiving is, is, is illness or condition based and can be an acute episode in someone's life. For example, providing care as someone is going through uh, chemotherapy or other types of uh, uh, either diseases or surgeries that require care. It is in these times, I think this crisis has brought up the fact that if there is a, a leaving the home and going out and going to a job is potentially threatening to the life of the person you're caring for, uh, especially now, of course, as anyone who is in 
uh, a family member having chemotherapy, their ability to lo to leave and go to work is just dramatically uh, bringing dramatic risk to the family. So I think we, um, this is a, another good example where I think we should be very inclusive of the term family caregiving with the understanding that sometimes it is for a, 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 a chronic condition or a can, caregiving condition that will require care for uh, a long period of time. And sometimes it's duration limited. Excellent point. Thank you. Other thoughts or questions, reactions to, to Lynn's presentation? I want to Lynn, make sure everyone. Lynn, this is Joan Weiss. Outstanding presentation. Okay. Thanks so much. Uh, I, I have uh, one question. Uh, I was wondering if you know uh, if there are lessons learned from other countries that might be able to help move this agenda forward in the states here. Uh, yes, there are some lessons learned. Thank you for that question, Joan. Um, the World Policy Center at UCLA um, has tracked family leave policies for a number of years. I can send a link to Greg and, and Wendy um, on some research. In fact, they've just released um, a new study looking at world uh, different countries' responses to COVID-19 and family leave issues. Um, I'll send that to you. Um, but they've also looked at longer term, get just guaranteeing uh, these workplace protections in other countries. So there are some lessons learned. Um, and I can, I'll share that link with both of them and they can provide that to you. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Lynn. Sure. Other thoughts or questions? Um, otherwise, we'll, we'll move into a wrap up for today. Um, I realize it's, it can be surprisingly tiresome to just sit in one spot and look at a screen for, for three hours. And so um, I, I thank everybody for, for their attention um, and to all of the presenters that we had today. Are there any other um, final comments or questions on anything that we have covered for today um, from anybody? This is Carol Zerniel. I just hey. think, you know, um, I think there have been several people that have talked about bold action. And I think the opportunity that COVID affords us is to take some bold action. Uh, there are intergenerational movements uh, for what the social contract will be going forward. Uh, there is a dissatisfaction with a state by state approach as opposed to a federal approach. And I think looking across generations and taking the opportunity for bold action is actually maybe better now than it might have been um, if we'll put that lens on and take advantage of uh, what families are experiencing right now. Great, hopefully you'll help us um, be able to capture some of those ideas in terms of what, what you would like to see, you know, more, more of a federal unified response versus the more of the state-based approach that you ref that you reference and where we may be able to pull that out in the national strategy and, and create those highlights. Okay, um, Wendy or Kitty, did you all have any um, final thoughts before we move into adjourn for the day? Just a, this is Wendy, just a very big thank you to the council members and to our speakers today. I have learned so much, I have pages of notes. So just a fantastic first day of meetings and I look forward to seeing everyone tomorrow afternoon, virtually. Yes. So um, yes, yeah, so we will, we will go ahead and wrap up for the day. If you all have an opportunity um, between now and um, tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern, um, if you could please spend some time with the latest iteration of the driver diagram, you know, look at it, look at the drivers that, that are there, what we've identified, look at the, some of the strategies and the actions and programs that we're, that are currently in the mix and we've given some thought to. Take today's information and see where you may want to make some suggestions for adding to it and beginning to build it out even further. We want to try to maximize the the hour or so that we have tomorrow to work on this. Um, but then we also are very excited about hearing two other 
very you know critical presentations that of of respite which we know now from the rfi was like the number one um, need and concern uh, for family caregivers and then we're also going to delve into some data and research because that's another critical area where we need to have some some really key insights in order to to build out our um you know our strategy a little bit further so spend some time with the driver diagram come back with um i'll challenge everybody to come back with no more no less than three places where you want to to add something or modify something or to build it out and let's see what if we can make some real progress tomorrow so with that we will wrap up and i will say have a great night and we will see you tomorrow thank you all thanks everyone thank you thank you everyone